Uh, the Subcommittee on Health will now come to order. Good morning, everyone, colleagues, and everyone that's joined us uh, in the hearing room, and welcome to our uh, witnesses. Uh, the Chair now recognizes herself for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, today, our subcommittee uh, uh, is going to consider four bills uh, to reauthorize uh, very important, critically important uh, public health programs uh, that support and improve the health and well-being of children, of adults, uh, and their caregivers. Very important, caregivers. Uh, I know because I've been one. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, our subcommittee's focus for June uh, has been to make sure that important health programs nearing their expiration are continued and in some cases expanded. Last week, uh, we held what I thought was a historic hearing about the need to address expiring Medicaid funds uh, for the territories. Uh, all the people that reside in the territories are American citizens. Uh, and uh, earlier in June, we considered extending 12 programs that strengthen public health and the Medicare and Medicaid programs. These hearings uh, have led to results. Last week, the House passed H.R. 3253, a bipartisan bill that extended several programs in Medicaid, including uh, Money Follows the Person program and the Excellence in Mental Health Demonstration program. I'm grateful to Representatives Dingell and Guthrie for their work on that bill. We're all grateful to them. Today, we continue our focus by hearing testimony on four bipartisan reauthorization bills, most of which were authored by members of this uh, committee. These bills support people at particularly vulnerable times in their lives. When a baby is born, during a pediatric emergency, after an autism diagnosis, or when serving as the primary caregiver for a loved one. Members of the subcommittee have, no doubt, experienced at least one of these vulnerable moments. Uh, and as I just mentioned, I certainly have, and so have millions of Americans. Too often, these experiences go untold, and what can be done to assist goes unexamined. Today, our witnesses are going to explain what people in these moments need and how these bills can help. The first bill, the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act, gives parents the peace of mind that their newborn will receive comprehensive diagnostic screening no matter where in the country they're born. Uh, through these screenings, each year, over 12,000 babies live healthier, longer lives because they receive life-saving treatments faster. The Emergency Medical Services for Children Reauthorization Act is uh, really, I think, about peace of mind. Uh, there's nothing scarier than when a child is critically ill or injured. Parents should be able to trust that their child will receive appropriate med medical care no matter what hospital they go to. This bill reauthorizes the only federal program dedicated to improving emergency medical care for children. The Autism Cares Act expands efforts to conduct research and provide services to people who are autistic with an important focus on addressing racial disparities. Black and Latino children with autism tend to be diagnosed later than, their, than white children and are often misdiagnosed. They have less access to services and are underrepresented in most autism research. This five-year reauthorization addresses these disparities, as well as other challenges related to autism research, education, and detection. Finally, the Lifespan Respite Care Reauthorization Act helps support the family members. And I think this is just so badly needed in our country. Uh, it helps support the family members who provide full-time care to their aging or disabled loved one. Being the unpaid caregiver for a loved one can be physically and emotionally exhausting and isolating. The average family caregiver is a woman who works full time and is providing care to both aging parents and children living at home. Um, that, is, uh, that should take everyone's breath away. Uh, through a five-year reauthorization of grant funds, this bill allows caregivers to take a temporary uh, break from their caregiving responsibility. 
so today's hearing is about helping people in situations that too often are overlooked by making sure we don't treat uh, children as little adults, that minority children are included in autism research, that we are supporting the people, mostly women, who are taking care of their loved ones every day. We're taking important steps toward the goal of quality health care for every American. I stand ready to work with uh, every single one of my colleagues to make sure that these programs are reauthorized. Uh, the chair now uh, has the pleasure of recognizing Dr. Burgess, the ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, for five minutes for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> As you said, we're here today to discuss the reauthorization of four public health programs that provide resources for critical and in some cases even life-saving care for Americans. These four bills, the Emergency Medical Services for Children Program Reauthorization, the Autism Cares Act, the Lifespan Respite Care Reauthorization Act and the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act all make a measurable impact on individuals' lives each and every day. The Emergency Medical Services for Children program was enacted in 1984. This was to provide grant funding to increase the ability of emergency medical systems to care for pediatric populations. Not only does the program provide funding so that emergency departments and hospitals can equip themselves with appropriate pediatric medical tools, it enables partnerships and drives research and innovation in emergency care for children. Last year, we reauthorized the Children's Hospital Graduate Medical Education Program and named the bill after one of my professors, Dr. Benji Brooks. I remember Dr. Brooks telling me at the start of my medical career that children are not just smaller versions of adults. Treating them is more complex than scaling down the size of the problem. It requires a whole host of separate tools and separate knowledge, and that's why this program is so important, especially at the hours of an emergency. Similarly, the Newborn Screening <coughs> Saves Lives Act, which passed for the first time in 2008, aims to improve the ability to address pediatric health by standardizing newborn screening programs. Newborn screenings are incredibly important in providing physicians and families with information regarding their baby's health, enabling them to practice early intervention and treatment if necessary. According to the March of Dimes, in 2007, only 10 states and Washington, D.C. required infant screening for the recommended disorders. Since enactment of the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act, all the states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico, screened for at least 29 of the 35 recommended conditions. This bill would reauthorize funding for the Health Resources and Services Administration, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the National Institute of Health to ensure that our newborn screening remains comprehensive and that our nation's health care providers are adequately equipped to conduct these screenings. Autism Cares builds upon the strong foundation that Congress laid by passing the Combating Autism Act in 2006. This legislation expanded research, it expanded surveillance and treatment of autism spectrum disorder, and has equipped our federal agencies with enhanced resources to expand its knowledge in this complex disorder. As the number of children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder have increased, it is even more important that we reauthorize this program and ensure the continuation of the interagency autism coordinating committee. As families across our nation navigate raising children with autism, the Autism Cares Act will provide hope by authorizing funding for continued research surveillance education at the NIH, the CDC, and HRSA. And certainly want to thank our colleague, Mr. Doyle, along with Chris Smith, who's been a standard bearer for this legislation, certainly as long as I've been here. The final piece of legislation we are considering today, the Lifespan Respite Care Reauthorization Act, would reauthorize funding for the Lifespan Respite Care Program through fiscal year 2024. Respite care is critical. It's a critical resource for caregivers who spend so much of their time helping their loved one through each day. Most insurance plans do not cover the cost of respite care, but the Administration for Community Living and the Department of Health and Human Services works with the ARCH National Respite Network and Resource Center to provide respite care to caregivers across the United States, ensuring that we maintain access to respite care 
for our caregivers and for our loved ones. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today and taking their time to testify before the subcommittee today. I look forward to a productive dialogue and moving these bills to the subcommittee and ultimately see them signed into law. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, the chairman of the full committee, for his five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today our committee is reviewing four bipartisan bills that would reauthorize programs that bolster America's medical research capacity and improve quality of life for millions of families. It's important that we ensure that the authorizations of these programs do not expire, and I'm grateful to the many members on and off our committee who have worked on these bills that will extend these programs. The first bill we're examining reauthorizes the Autism Cares Act. This reauthorization is important in order to continue critical research, surveillance, education, early detection, and intervention programs for people living with autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, and their families. The legislation would also expand efforts to support all individuals with ASD across their lifespan, regardless of age, and it would encourage greater research efforts into reducing disparities among people from diverse racial, ethnic, geographic, or linguistic backgrounds. The committee will also review legislation reauthorizing the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act. Each year, more than 12,000 babies are born with conditions that might not be readily apparent, requiring early detection and treatment. Since it was first signed into law in 2008, this law has made great strides to ensure that all children receive recommended screening. And this reauthorization bill will bring us closer to the goal of every child born in the United States receiving all recommended screening tests, ensuring better treatment and long-term health outcomes. And I want to thank Representative Roybal Allard, who has championed this program since it was first passed more than 10 years ago. While the newborn screening legislation ensures proper care for children from the moment they are born, the Emergency Medical Services for Children program ensures that children are safe and receive proper treatment if emergency care is ever required. As I'm sure our witness will attest, treating children in emergency situations can be very different from treating adults. If ever a parent or caregiver is required to call 911 to get emergency care for a child, they should know that children will receive the medical care they need. And this program provides the important research and training necessary to provide quality emergency care for children, no matter where they're located in the country. And finally, the committee will review a proposal by Representative Langevin to reauthorize the Lifespan Respite Care Program. This program provides much needed respite services and educational resources to family caregivers of children and adults of all ages with special needs, and I urge support for its reauthorization. I want to thank all the witnesses, look forward to the testimony, and I yield now the remainder of my time to Representative, also known as Coach Doyle, uh, the leader of the Autism Caucus and a longtime champion of the Autism Cares Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, yielding your time to me. And I also want to thank uh, Chairwoman Eshoo, my good friend, uh, for holding this important hearing today. Uh, you know, when Chris Smith and I founded the Autism Caucus uh, almost 19 years ago, uh, most members of Congress's uh, knowledge of autism was if they saw the movie The Rain Man. Uh, NIH and CDC weren't spending much money doing any research, and, and, uh, and little was known ab about this disorder. Um, we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, back in 2006, when we first started working on the, the first CARES Act, uh, over $3.1 billion has now been dedicated to the NIH, CDC, and HRSA to understand autism spectrum disorders and to find the right intervention and support for each unique individual. Uh, funding's also been used to support the training and education of health professionals, to provide resources for families, and coordinate efforts across the federal agencies at the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee. These efforts have translated into real-life support for individuals and families, uh, although, as I said, we still have a long way to go. Uh, this room today is full of self-advocates, family, friends, and neighbors who have worked tirelessly to pass this legislation, uh, including our witness, Dr. Hewitt. Uh, it is for all of you uh, that we are here today and, and that we are especially grateful to because none of this uh, would have happened without uh, your support and persistence in pushing us to keep going further and further. So uh, I want to thank uh, not only all the, all the advocates in the audience and the parents. Uh, the parents are the reason we've come this far. Uh, 
you deal with a parent of an autistic child, uh, you're, you're dealing with someone determined to make sure that this Congress uh, does what we need to do, and, and we're going to try to continue to do that. Um, Madam Chair, I want to thank you. Uh, I came to you earlier and, and asked for this hearing, and you've been very gracious, as, as has the Chairman uh, uh, Pallone. Uh, I hope that we can move quickly to uh, a markup uh, in, in subcommittee and full committee uh, and get this bill passed as soon as possible uh, with the commensurate authorization and funding levels. So I thank you very much, and I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Um, I would say to Mr. Doyle, promises uh, made, promises kept. Thank you for your magnificent work. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, uh, the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good Thanks morning. for having this hearing. <clears throat> Thanks to you and ranking member Burgess uh, for your work on this and the other members of the committee, Mr. Doyle, and, and certainly off committee, uh, Chris Smith's been so involved in this autism effort. Uh, the four bipartisan bills we're considering today are a great start. Um, obviously, we all know we have some more work to do uh, to fund our nation's community health centers and uh, special diabetes programs and some other priorities I know the committee's working on. So I want to thank our witnesses today for helping us uh, better understand these bills and issues. We look forward to your testimony. Our work will be improved by your participation. At this hearing, as you've heard, we'll consider four bipartisan bills to reauthorize these common sense public health programs that make a real difference for patients, for families, uh, for our communities. And as you've heard, uh, H.R. 1058, the Autism Cares Act of 2019, introduced by Representative Smith and Doyle, the number of children diagnosed with autism specter disorder has increased over the last several years. And part of this trend may be due to improvements in diagnosis and data collection, but we need to learn more about uh, autism specter disorders and identify them at a younger age. Uh, and we need to continue our push to more effectively treat this spectrum of conditions. Second bill, as you've heard, the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act of 2019 um, authorizes a five-year extension of this really important program to screen newborns, to boost transparency, to get better data, and uh, to have states participate in the best practices for newborn screening. So I think this one's really important as well. And then H.R. 776, the Emergency Medical Services for Children Program Reauthorization Act, um, is the only federal program, I believe, that specifically focuses on addressing the unique needs of children in emergency medical systems. Uh, these grants represent an investment in research regarding best practices, state partnerships to boost capacity for pediatric care, and better data to inform innovation all with the goal of improving care for our children in the healthcare system across our nation. And then finally, H.R. 2035, the Lifespan Respite Care Reauthorization Act of 2019. Uh, this program is really important to me. First, in 1997, my home state of Oregon became the first state uh, in the nation to create a lifespan respite program to provide relief to family caregivers. Now, other states soon uh, followed suit, and since 2009, the federal government has offered grants to aid in the implementation of these programs. I've often joined my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to boost resources for family caregivers as taking care of a child or an adult with special needs uh, is an important duty. Now I'm pleased to be, considered, uh, to be considering the five-year reauthorization of the National Respite Care Program to help reduce the burnout and stress associated with caring for a family member. So in closing, thanks again to our witnesses. We appreciate your being here today, and thanks uh, to, to Chairwoman Eshoo and Ranking Member Burgess for this hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. I know that uh, all the members have... Uh, uh, fabulous opening statements and uh, remind you that uh, pursuant to committee rules, uh, your written uh, opening statements shall be made part of the record. So uh, submit those for the record. I now would like to introduce uh, uh, the witnesses uh, for today's hearing. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and thank you for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, we depend on you for expertise and we have four of you. Uh, the first, Dr. Amy Hewitt, uh, the director of the Institute on Community Integration, College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota. Welcome to you and our uh, collective thanks to you. Uh, Ms. Jill Kagan, uh, the director of ARCH, a national respite uh, network and resource center, uh, National Respite Coalition. Thank you to you for 
uh, for your fine work and for being here. Dr. Patricia Kunz Howard, the president of Emergency Nurses Association. Thank you to you and a warm welcome. And uh, Dr. Joseph uh, Bocchini, uh, professor of pediatrics, uh, Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center at Shreveport. Thank you uh, to you, doctor, and a warm welcome. Um, uh, at this time, the chair is going to recognize each witness for five minutes to provide uh, your opening statements. Uh, bring the microphones close to you so that everyone can hear you very well. And uh, when it's time to testify, make sure you turn it on. Uh, the red light means stop. You'll see um, green, yellow, red light. Don't run the red light. How's that? So uh, with that, uh, we'll start with Dr. Amy Hewitt. Again, welcome. and. Uh, uh, our thanks to you for uh, being here today to offer your expert testimony. You have five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Burgess, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here to testify about H.R. 1058 that will reauthorize the CARES Act. It's a great honor to appear here before you today. I'm the director of the Institute on Community Integration at the University of Minnesota. Our center is privileged to have several CARES projects, including an Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Program, or the ADAM, the Centers for D Disease Prevention um, and Control Learn the Signs Act Early Campaign, and a Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities Program known as the LEND. I'm also the proud alum of a LEND program, having received training at Riley Child Development Center in Indiana over 30 years ago. I'm the current president of the board of directors of the Association of University Centers on Disabilities, a network that includes all of the LEND programs and a national resource center that provides technical assistance to CARES programs. Autism and related neurodevelopmental disabilities pose significant challenges to communities across the United States. Our ADAM data estimates that one in 59 children have autism and roughly one in six children have related developmental disabilities. What this means is that it's highly likely that everyone in this room knows someone that has a family member with autism or a developmental disability. While I'm here in my professional role as a researcher, I understand these issues as a family member too. My brother-in-law Nathan is 45 years old and he has autism. He reminds me daily that early intervention is critical and that children grow up to become working adults who want good lives in their communities. We have so much to learn from autistic adults about the <coughs> system we create to support people across their lives. CARES has helped to build a critical infrastructure addressing our understanding of autism. It supports the ADAM network funded by the CDC to estimate the number of children and other developmental disabilities. ADAM's findings identify characteristics of children with autism and the age at which they were evaluated and diagnosed. Reauthorization provides hope that in Minnesota we'll be able to increase our geographic area and gather lifespan data. This is important because in addition to demographic categories routinely studied by the CDC, we want to understand prevalence for our Somali, Hmong, and other immigrant populations. Expansion of the geographic area is the only way we'll be able to know with certainty if differences exist among these groups. The CARES Act also funds work workforce programs. Nationally, there's a serious shortage of personnel trained about autism. LEND programs provide advanced training to fellows from a broad array of disciplines in the identification, assessment, and treatment of children, youth, and young adults with developmental disabilities, including ASD. The Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics Training Program trains the next generation of physicians to build capacity to develop and provide evidence-based interventions. CARES reauthorization includes a priority to award DBP programs in rural communities, which is also important. CARES authorizes the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, known as the IAC Committee, to coordinate federal efforts to advise the Secretary of Health and Human Services on issues related to ASD. 
with both federal and public members, including people with lived experience of autism, the IAC helps to ensure that a wide range of perspectives are represented on the committee. Reauthorization expands the IAC membership to include representatives from the Departments of Labor, Justice, Housing, and Urban Development. CARES programs have intentionally focused on strategic partnerships in states with maternal and child health Title V programs, resulting in more effective and coordinated leadership with co coalitions. Act Early Ambassadors work with programs to reach diverse communities with a focus on parent-to-parent -parent networking. And in Minnesota, we see how the alignment of research and systems ensures that we are more effectively supporting people. CARES supports NIH-funded research through Autism Centers of Excellence, which conduct research on possible treatments and interventions, then report findings to the National Database on Autism Research. This research answers critical questions that influence policy. CARES requires an evaluation report on both progress and needs. Evaluation findings were used to introduce new requirements to report uh, in, so that the evaluation report includes information on community-based uh, services, reflecting a growing need to expand research, service, and collaboration across all ages. In closing, the CARE shows the commitment from each of you to provide a coordinated federal response to the needs of individuals with ASD in your districts throughout the United States. This legislation has answered critical questions to address disparities through research, public health surveillance, and workforce development. I urge you to renew the investment and enact a five-year reauthorization before it expires on September 30th. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hewitt. Um, I, I want to thank all the advocates that are here. Um, we all know what to do from inside the institution, uh, but the truth about the Congress is, is that we're not a proactive institution. We're reactive. So there always has to be a push, push, push from the outside. And uh, pushing you are, and, um, and we're going to respond to it. So thank you for being here. You're really important. Um, Ms. Kagan, welcome to you. And you have uh, uh, five minutes for your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Burgess, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I'm Jill Kagan, director of the ARCH National Respite Network and Resource Center, and I am testifying today on behalf of the National Respite Coalition, which is the policy uh, division of ARCH. I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify today in support of the Lifespan Respite Care Program. I would also like to thank our original co-sponsors of the legislation uh, to reauthorize the program, Representative Jim Langevin and Representative Kathy McMorris-Rogers, for their leadership and support of the bill. As many of you have already uh, talked about, you know what respite is. Uh, it is the planned or emergency care provided to an individual of any age with special needs in order to provide temporary relief to the family caregivers. For the more than 40 million family caregivers providing care to a child or adult with a disability or chronic condition, respite is a lifeline. Caregiving is a lifespan issue, with more than half of family caregivers caring for someone under the age of 75, including adults with multiple sclerosis, adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities or mental health issues, young veterans with PTSD or traumatic brain injury, and nearly 14 million children with special health care needs, uh, including children and adults with autism. Respite is among the most frequently requested services by family caregivers. By helping to reduce stress, caregiver burden, and social isolation, the beneficial of, of effects of uh, respite on family health and uh, family caregiver health and well-being, on their family's quality of life, and in also helping to reduce or avoid more costly out-of-home placements, these benefits are well documented. Yet 85% of family caregivers of adults and a similar percentage of parents of children are not receiving services at all because of fragmented and narrowly targeted services, uh, long waiting lists, uh, prohibitive costs to families who don't qualify for public programs, and the lack of information about respite, what it is, how to find it, uh, and how to use it. 
Uh, moreover, a critically short supply of well-trained respite providers and respite program options may prohibit a family from using the service that they so desperately need. By providing more respite care and making it easier to find, pay for, and use, lifespan respite care programs are helping to overcome many of these barriers. The Administration for Community Living uh, awards grants to states on a competitive basis. Uh, to date, 37 states and the District of Columbia have received at least one grant since 2009 when the program was first funded. And the Lifespan Respite Grantee activities have really evolved uh, from that time from systems building uh, of coordinated statewide respite programs to now really uh, allowing states to provide more direct services. 18 states uh, have helped families not eligible for public programs or on waiting lists uh, actually pay for planned and emergency respite through consumer-directed uh, respite voucher programs. Other states have provided respite by expanding community, faith-based, and volunteer respite services. States are engaged in the very important uh, a role of building capacity through recruiting and training respite providers and volunteers. And partnerships between local, between state and local agencies are, are able to then maximize use of existing resources that may already exist in the state. We're very pleased to announce too that states are collaborating with aging and disability resource centers uh, or, their, or states no wrong door systems to increase access to respite services information and providers. And other grantees have been very successful with their partners in leveraging additional federal, state, and private dollars because of their federal grants. The National Respite Coalition and 47 national organizations have endorsed H.R. 2035 to ensure the program stability, allow states to continue to serve more family caregivers, and provide opportunities for new states to participate. Current law gives states the flexibility and local control to meet the program's requirements so that each state can determine the best approaches to address their own unique identified needs for respite and provide critical gap-filling services. The Lifespan Respite Care Program is the only federal program that prioritizes respite for all ages and conditions, allows states to use start funds for startup of new uh, innovative and evidence-informed programs, and supports training of respite providers to address the direct care worker shortage. This is a very tall order, but states are meeting the challenges head on, and we urge Congress to uh, support its initial investment in these successful efforts uh, and reauthorize the program in a timely way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Kagan. Uh, uh, I now would like to recognize uh, Dr. Uh, Kuntz Howard, uh, for your testimony, you have five minutes, and welcome and thank you again. Thank you. Uh, Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Burgess, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify at this important hearing on vital health care programs that serve American families and in support of the Emergency Medical Services for Children Program Reauthorization Act of 2019. I am Patricia Coons Howard, the Enterprise Director for Emergency Services at the University of Kentucky Healthcare, which includes a full service academic medical center and a community hospital in Lexington. Between the two emergency departments, we treat over 35,000 children each year. And for the past 29 years, I have also served as the EMS educator for Lexington Fire and Emergency Services training paramedics. In addition, I am the 2019 president of the Emergency Nurses Association, the largest professional health care organization dedicated to uh, improving emergency care with over 44,000 members worldwide. As a registered nurse and educator, I have dedicated my professional career to providing the best possible care for all patients regardless of their age. And as a pediatric clinical nurse specialist, I know that caring for children is one of the greatest responsibilities we have as healthcare professionals. In the United States, children and adolescents make up 27% of all emergency department visits. As you know, this patient population presents unique challenges for healthcare professionals during an emergency, requiring specific types of equipment and often different medication dosage regimens. Nevertheless, this reality is that many facilities and healthcare professionals in the most vulnerable areas of our country would struggle to maintain these resources if not for the existence of the EMSC program. As you know, in 1984, Congress recognized the disparities that existed in emergency care between adult and pediatric patients and created the EMSC for Children program. 
More than 30 years later, it is the only federal program wholly devoted to improving pediatric emergency care. The MSC program in, uh, enhances care no matter where children live, travel, or attend school. It accomplishes this by helping ensure that hospitals and EMS systems have access to pediatric appropriate training, education, and resources. Under the EMSC state partnership grants, funds are made available to each state EMSC program, which in turn are used to help hospitals and EMS systems meet performance measures to improve pediatric readiness and to deliver quality care to children. For example, state partnership grants have helped develop interfacility transfer guidelines that define the process for selecting the correct hospital for the pediatric patient to be transferred to, ensuring appropriate staffing on the transport vehicle to match the needs of the child in their clinical condition, as well as having the plans to help immediately facilitate that transfer to the receiving facility. These guidelines have assured higher quality care for ill or injured pediatric patients and ultimately better outcomes. EMSC support has also been used to help uh, with the purchase of specialized equipment and supplies. One great example is the various types and sizes of life-saving airway equipment used by EMS to be able to treat a tiny preterm infant or a much larger child. Another key component of the EMSC program is the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network, or PCARN, which is the first federally supported research initiative focused on improving emergency care for children. Because of the research conducted by PCARN, advancements have been made in many treatment options for children. One of these that is so important in emergency care is the pediatric head injury and treatment algorithm that was developed to lead to the reduction in unnecessary radiation exposure by CT scans when children have suffered minor head injuries, which helps reduce their long-term risk for cancer. EMSC developed research has also led to better identification of adolescents at risk for substance abuse and improved strategies to quickly identify children suffering from bacterial infections which have an increased risk of sepsis. As an emergency nurse, I know from firsthand experience what a critical resource the EMSC program is to facilities across the country. Working as a team, nurses, EMS, and physicians are better able to manage all types of pediatric emergencies thanks to the resources and training that the EMSC programs have helped to provide. In my home state of Kentucky, the EMSC program has sponsored education for pre-hospital as well as in-hospital professionals regarding emergency care for children. Ambulance services now have access to correct equipment and specialized knowledge thanks to this program. Without this program, the critical care we are to provide for children in Kentucky, and I'm sure in other states, would suffer. Emergency nurses and our professional colleagues passionately care about providing the highest quality care to all of our patients, and we strive for them to have the best outcomes possible for their illnesses and injuries. This is especially the case for those who are among the most vulnerable in our society and who are in need of specialized, high-quality health care services, our children. Thank you again for providing me the opportunity to represent the emergency care community and speak in support of reauthorizing the Emergency Medical Services for Children program. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kunz-Howard. I now would like to recognize uh, Dr. Bocchini. Uh, you're, uh, you have five minutes for your testimony. Am I pronouncing your name? That is correct, uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, uh, Woman Eshoo, Ranking Member Burgess, and Distinguished Health Subcommittee members, thank you for inviting me to speak before this committee today. I have recently had the privilege of serving an eight-year term as the chairman of the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children, the advisory committee whose current activities are determined by the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act of 2014. I've seen the benefits of this act through the eyes of the advisory committee, in my clinical practice, and in the infants whose lives have been improved, and in many cases saved, through the prompt diagnosis and treatment of conditions identified by newborn screening. The Newborn Screening Saves Lives, Act, uh, Lives Reauthorization Act of 2019 is a critical piece of legislation which supports one of the most successful public health disease prevention programs in the United States. Congress first enacted the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act in 2008 with the realization that federal input was essential to developing a uniform, evidence-based national newborn screening panel that would lead to the universal application by states of the new technologies and treatments becoming available for a number of serious and life-threatening conditions affecting infants and children, which are not apparent at birth. Congress also recognized that federal agencies served an important role in supporting states through a variety of mechanisms, including educational and training activities, research, technical assistance, and infrastructure development. 
Over the past 11 years, federal input from the Advisory Committee, approval of its recommendations by the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, research supported by the National Institute of Health, laboratory improvement efforts by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and funding to help improve state screening programs from the Health Resources and Services Administration have greatly benefited infants uh, and families by helping to advance this highly successful state-based public health system. Although each of the conditions recommended for newborn screening are considered rare, one in approximately 300, every 300 uh, screened newborn infants is found to have a condition for which treatment is beneficial. Early diagnosis enables the infants identified through newborn screening to receive the treatments necessary to prevent serious and often permanent permanent developmental and other complications or death. For many of the conditions on this panel, early diagnosis and treatment not only benefits the infant, but it is cost saving. In 2010, the Secretary of HHS officially adopted the first recommended uniform screening uh, panel, or RUSP, which included 29 primary conditions and 25 secondary conditions. Within a few years, all states were screening for these conditions. With the screening panel, as has been mentioned before, approximately 12,500 newborn infants were being identified annually with serious genetic, endocrine, and metabolic conditions, including congenital hypothyroidism, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, and hearing loss, as well as a number of other metabolic conditions that are uh, significantly rare. Rapid advances in diagnosis and treatment has led to the inclusion of six additional conditions on the RUSP. They include severe combined immunodeficiency, critical congenital heart disease, Pompeii disease, mucopolysaccharidosis type 1, adrenal leukodystrophy, and most recently spinal muscular atrophy. Much remains to be done to continue to improve the capacity and effectiveness of the newborn screening system. HR 2507, as written, will strengthen the newborn screening program in individual states help meet the research and clinical challenges of this rapidly advancing field, and have a significant positive impact on the health and well-being of the nearly 4 million children born each year in the United States and its territories. I expect that new screening and diagnostic, diagnostic tests and therapies will soon bring more conditions to the advisory committee for its evidence-based evaluations. HR 2507 will also strengthen the efforts to evaluate new technologies, and to bring new conditions to the newborn screening program by increasing needed funding for the efforts of HRSA, the NIH through the Hunter Kelly Newborn Screening Research Program, and the CDC. The additional funding will allow for enhanced technical assistance and financial support for states, which will reduce barriers to implementation of new conditions and shorten the time needed for states to begin screening once a condition is approved for inclusion on the RUSP. Once again, I thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of this Reauthorization Act. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. It's exciting to uh, hear a firsthand report from someone on the, uh, on the uh, is it a commission? The committee. The yes. committee. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So um, uh, now we will, we've concluded um, the uh, testimony of the witnesses, uh, I want to um, welcome uh, Congressman uh, Chris Smith, who's joined us. Uh, he has been an uh, indefatigable leader on the issue of the uh, Autism Cares Act, and we're thrilled that you're here today and that uh, we're taking up uh, uh, legislation. Congressman Doyle was here earlier, so uh, welcome to you and thank you for your wonderful work. Um, uh, the chair is going to recognize herself for five minutes to ask questions. Um, Dr. Hewitt, do we know what causes autism? There isn't a single cause of autism. Um, we know that there is an inner intersection between um, genetics. We know there's a genetic component, and the importance of the research that the, the CARES Act would fund would be to help us continue to explore um, what causation is, but, but more importantly, 
to make sure that we're identifying children early and getting them connected to services and supports in their mm -hmm. community. So now you mentioned your brother-in-law, who's what you said, I think 43 45. years, 45. And um, um, when was he diagnosed? Unfortunately, Nathan wasn't diagnosed until he was 17. Mm. And so what, in that gap of... So what what did he, had he been end diagnosed up, earlier? How was he held back given the gap that you describe? So so for Nathan, he really received inappropriate educational services his entire uh, 12 years of education. He ended high school without a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. And had he had early intervention, I think his 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 life outcomes would have been substantially different than they are now. Mm -hmm. So um, where do you think we are um, in terms of, how, how would you, uh, what kind of score would you give the United States of America on, uh, on the progress that we've made on autism, both uh, in terms of early detection and then the services that are needed? I think that's kind of the $64,000 question to me. <laughs> it's my, a my sister teaches um, uh, children with autism and uh, she, uh, she has taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're doing mm -hmm. much better at identifying children early. If you look at the ADAM data, it shows that we're, we're, we're inching um, towards identifying kids younger. And in some, some states are doing better than other states, but we're making progress in early identification mm -hmm. and getting kids connected to services. Well, thank you for everything that you've done to move the needle. Uh, Ms. Kagan, I'm, I'm struck by the uh, statistic in your testimony that 85% of family caregivers of adults are not receiving any respite services whatsoever. Uh, in my previous life before coming to Congress. I was a member of a county board of supervisors and uh, established uh, more than one adult uh, day health care centers so that the caregivers would have some rest. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when I look at the dollars, and there is an increase in this, uh, but for 50 states, it's, it's not even a million dollars for each state. Um, so we're, I think, on the right pathway. But um, uh, how many states did you said did you say have absolutely no respite services whatsoever? Well, there have been 37 states in the District of Columbia that have received at least one lifespan respite grant. So there we, we still have a large chunk of states that have never received a lifespan grant. There are other federal sources of funding for uh -huh. respite, but as I mentioned. Medicaid home and community-based waivers, for example, are often very narrowly targeted, um, don't exist across states in the same way, and have long waiting lists. Uh, programs like National Family Caregiver Support Program also offer important respite, but only primarily for the aging population, not only, but primarily. Well, so, in uh, the health affairs found that by 2029, many seniors will be what they term uh, in the forgotten middle. Uh, where they won't qualify for Medicaid, but also won't be able to afford to pay uh, for long-term care. So uh, my question to you is, how can family caregivers help address that problem? And what, the larger question is, what do you recommend Congress should be doing now to create a better system of support for the caregivers, not only today, but for tomorrow? Yeah, absolutely. I think the Lifespan Respite Care Program, of course, is an important first step because it not only helps pay for respite for families who don't qualify for those public programs but right. have exorbitant expenses related to their caregiving duties or have or had to give up employment in order to stay home and provide care. But Lifespan Respite also allows states to use their funds to address the capacity issue. We have a tremendous crisis in direct uh, service worker shortages. And lifespan respite programs, most of the states are doing some kind of recruiting and training of respite workers as well as volunteers uh, because we're just not going to have the bodies. It's <laughs> overwhelming. It really is for the care. Thank you to each one of you. I wish I had more time. I don't. Uh, and um, uh, I now would like to yield uh, uh, five minutes to uh, Dr. Burgess, uh, the ranking member of the subcommittee, for his questions. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chairwoman. We need a doctor for the doctor. Yeah. He doesn't feel well today. 
we went late in rules committee last night, yeah. so I used up all my vocal abilities last night. So, Dr. Puccini and um, Dr. Hewitt, you're sitting on opposite ends of this panel, but Dr. Puccini, maybe you want to develop an early screening method for the autism gene and be able to provide kids therapy before they leave the newborn nursery. Is that is that ever on your horizon? I'm, I'm not aware of, of it. Certainly, um, there are a number of uh, known genetic uh, um, uh, changes that have been associated with autism, and I'm not sure of the total percentage of autistic cases that are associated with specific gene abnormalities, but there is a panel that can be used to diagnose some of the patients, some of the individuals with autism. Whether a newborn screening test would become an appropriate way to evaluate that, I think, uh, is something to be considered for the future. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when you went through your list, um, I mean, that was fascinating. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize severe combined dopamine deficiency disease was uh, one of those things that you can detect. When I was in medical school, and it was a long time ago, but David the Bubble Boy, his doctor was in Houston, and we through a rudimentary telecommunications hookup, got to interview David the Bubble Boy when, uh, when, when he was still in, in uh, being protected from all things in the outside world. But now you can detect that disease as part of newborn screening? Yes, that uh, is certainly one of the recent successes in newborn screening. A severe combined immune deficiency is the disorder that the boy in the bubble uh, had. Um, it is a complete absence of, a, of an immune system, and if those, and those patients develop an infection, which they do quite early, um, it's typically very difficult to treat and is, t is usually fatal. If you find these children before they become infected, and that's what newborn screening does in most cases, um, you can provide a reconstitution of the immune system by a tr bone marrow transplant or umbilical a stem cell transplant or, or by enzyme replacement in some cases. Um, and the recent data from California and from other states have indicated that we're, we're at a 90 plus percent recovery uh, uh, success rate in, in having those children live and in many cases with a fully reconstituted immune system. So it's a very significant success story. And <clears throat> thank you for sharing that with us. The uh, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, which was one of the things on your list, and the recent FDA approval of a, of a new therapy that will be life-changing, I understand, for those kids. So the work that you do in identifying those children early is, is just so critical. Yes, I agree. I, I think that there have been some remarkable advances in the, uh, in the treatment of spinal muscular atrophy. And the committee in 2018 did recommend to the secretary, and the secretary approved, including spinal muscular atrophy uh, on the uh, on the RUSP. In a number of states, I think it's up to 19. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's up to maybe about six states that are now screening. Many uh, are also trying to work through the issues that are needed to implement sure. screening for it. Well, it's a cost issue, and, and right. <clears throat> clearly that's one of the areas where we're focused as well. We delivered cures for the 21st century a couple of Congresses ago, but cures don't do any good if they're not available to the people. And now, with breakthroughs like this, we've got to figure out ways to make them available to the people. Dr. Howard, um, thank you so much for your uh, testimony today. I, I think your Emergency Nurses Network uh, helped me with the Mission Zero Act that uh, we got added to the Pandemic All Hazard Preparedness Act. So thank you for that, and that will be signed literally at any time. I think so it was it, last night. Oh, was yeah, it wasn't last night. Okay, so it became law. law. So we're good for us. We 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 got to win on the board with that one. And thanks for your help on that. Um, as far as just developing the uh, your partnership grants for the interfacility transfer guidelines for pediatric patients but they're not completely universally accepted. Is that correct? That is so, correct. So what's the problem here? <clears throat> well, the problem is not every state has defined trauma systems, which is one of the bigger reasons we see in our facility transport. And so not every state has the same type of uh, EMS system in place, and that is a challenge. So what uh, <clears throat> if we reauthorize this bill, are we going to get closer to achieving that goal? 
I think that there is consistent work that is done as part of this reauthorization. One of the other big pieces is the pediatric readiness work that is being done, which I didn't talk about, which is really helping every emergency department be more pediatric ready, which is a key consideration because many are not. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, Dr. Bikini, let me just ask you very quickly, are you going to uh, bring up at the committee um, the issue of um, autism so and screening I, I, and I what have, might be available? Yeah, I, I have, uh, I'm no longer a member of the committee. I have completed my term, He's but I certainly place. can provide that information back to the committee. Thank okay, you. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, I now uh, have the pleasure of recognizing the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Matsui, for her five minutes question. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I want to thank the witnesses who are here today. Every one of you spoke to issues and concerns that affect every single one of us or our constituents or our families. Um, investment in public health programs and infrastructure is critical to our nation's health and well-being. The programs we're discussing today are designed to bolster communities' ability to cope with health problems and the special needs for at-risk subgroups, and they have proven they can do just that if we fund and support them. Autism is a lifelong disorder, and for many families, there can be great uncertainty over how the needs of autistic children will be met as they age out of school-based services and grow into adulthood. I can tell you that in Sacramento, my district, we had parents come together to really develop an autism, the MIND Institute, which has been there for over 25 years and does great work, but it's parents and advocates that really did that because they know that having access to comprehensive range of services and strong systems of support, they all believe they should be guaranteed for people all, of all disabilities for their entire lives. Now, Dr. Hewitt, where do the greatest gaps in understanding autism still exist, and how will this reauthorization support expanding key activities and areas of focus for autism research? I think one of the largest gaps is understanding issues related to adults with autism. And yeah. so CARES gets us moving in that direction by uh, addressing issues across the lifespan. Through LEND training programs, we're expected to teach and train the next generation of leaders across all different kinds of health and allied health uh, disciplines about autism and the life course of a person with autism. The CDC's uh, surveillance program mm -hmm. is expanding um, in a few of its sites, the surveillance up to 16-year-olds now. So I think CARES gets us, again, a little bit, bit farther along the lifespan. Um, but you're saying that's not important. far enough yet, really. I, there, there's a lot of room to, to grow, right, but it absolutely. gets us moving in the right direction. That's good. Now, we know that young people with autism can face significant mental and behavioral health challenges and that other autism-related health conditions like disruptive sleep cycles and painful GI disorders can contribute to crisis episodes. Ms. Hewitt, how are providers addressing the special needs of the autism community? Are there mainstream evidence-based strategies for preventing and treating a mental health crisis for people with autism? Sure, there, there are a number of, of there's, there is much, a, a body of research to help us guide practitioners. We do that through our LEN programs, the Developmental Behavioral Pediatrician Training Programs. That's the purpose, is to connect practitioners to evidence-based practices that then they use in their community work. Okay. So it's, we, we need to learn right. more, um, but we also need to get practitioners informed and educated about what we already do know so that they're using those interventions in their work. Okay, Dr. Howard, of the innovative research and training programs supported by the Emergency Medical Services for Children programs, are autism-tailored services a focus for improving overall pediatric emergency care? If not, how can we work to broaden the program scope? So I, I'm not aware that there are autism-specific programs, but I think that's a really great inclusion. There are programs for children with special health care needs, and so that certainly would fall within that group where we tailor the treatments that we do differently for these children. For example, 
we don't necessarily immobilize the child with a special health care right. need the way we do with a, a child that doesn't have a developmental challenge. Mm -hmm. So, um, indeed, those are considerations that are worked with. Okay, thank you. Now, when discussing the needs of our nation's older Americans, we must ensure that policy reflects an inclusive focus on the need of caregivers and how aging impacts the entire family. That's why I'm really supportive of this increased funding for the Lifespan Respite Care Program to really recognizing the incredible value of our family caregivers and give them greater access to the support and relief they need. And many times, those are our only caregivers. Um, Ms. Kagan, how do disparate funding sources inhibit a state's ability to provide comprehensive and coordinated respite care programs? Yes, yeah, states, because of their multiple funding streams and, and service avenues, it becomes very confusing to family caregivers to figure out how to access those services, to figure out which programs they might qualify for. Uh, for many caregivers, they don't even recognize what respite is and that there's a service available to them. So by giving the state the opportunity to identify all those funding streams and services in the state, and put them in a format that they can then translate that information for family caregivers certainly helps them uh, access the system. So you're and saying that maze. better information better disseminated. Information, yeah. Okay, thank you, and I yield back. The gentlewoman um, yields back. It would be wonderful for doctors' offices to know so they could advise their, uh, when the caregiver brings their loved one in, they can say, well, you need a break, and here's something for you. I wish I had that, but, you know, I mean, it's, we all know what this is, and if there's someone that doesn't, then uh, it's what's in store for you. <laughs> Chairs of subcommittees may need that, too. Yeah, exactly. And Thank ranking you. members. <laughs> I know. Uh, the chair uh, is happy to recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Walden, for his Thank five you, minutes of chair. questions. So, Ms. Kagan, I'm, a, as you heard, a strong supporter of patients receiving the care they need in their homes, if at all possible. Oregon led on this way back with Project Independence. I think we still have a Medicaid waiver. It's been very good for families as well as, I think, the taxpayers. Um, how does respite care help keep a caregiver's loved one at home and out of a nursing home? And how does respite care ultimately reduce costs to our federal health programs? Yes, by... It's well documented that respite directly correlates with reduced stress and feelings mm -hmm. of caregiver burden. And when we reduce the stress and caregiver burden of the family caregivers, uh, their health is improved as well. So they can continue to provide that care at home. 80% uh, of long-term services and supports are provided at home, especially for older individuals. Yeah. And um, so we really need to support the family caregiver's health and well-being and that of their entire family so they can support that loved one at home. So it's actually a savings to taxpayers yes, in many absolutely. ways. It can also help reduce uh, use of emergency rooms. Right. Um, we're increasingly seeing some family caregivers take their loved ones to the emergency room just for a break because they oh. have no other option. Oh, that's um, not So what that's we a want. very costly. Yeah, that's expensive. <laughs> costly most expensive portal into the health care delivery system right there. Huh. So in your testimony, you described the great work of states in, in leveraging uh, lifespan respite care program dollars, and these dollars we know are used in a, in a variety of ways. Can you explain why allowing state grantees to innovate improves overall respite care services? These would be called softball questions, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> um, by giving states the flexibility to innovate, uh, we can continue to explore what works best for family caregivers. And we, uh, we know for sure that there's no one single respite model that works for all family caregivers. Sure. Even Everybody's over the different. course of a month, a, a family caregiver may desire different forms mm -hmm. of respite, in-home, out-of-home, uh, volunteer companion services to help their loved one uh, perhaps get out into the community and do something meaningful for them as well. So by allowing us to explore these other options, we not only help us figure out where we want to invest public dollars, but it helps us identify where in the uh, informal service sector, what, what community activities already exist mm. uh, in, in terms of natural supports that can, sure. can help families identify that they can use for respite. Because often they don't even know, probably, exactly. right? This something comes on you or your spouse, and there you are, and you've never even thought about it. And right. now you own it, and it's it's a challenge. It's okay. a challenge, and you can the other spouse or whoever the caregiver is can really get worn down, and then you, they have a problem. Exactly. If you don't we're, give them a little. Trying to, to 
protect the, the person with right. a health or disability and having a meaningful, healthy life, but we also have to protect their caregiver and their family as That's well right. to support them. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it firsthand. Dr. Uh, Howard, you mentioned that the EMSC program covers both pre-hospital EMS and emergency departments. Can you expand a little more um, on the improvements in the care for pre-hospital EMS and why those improvements can be critical in saving an injured child's life? Well, pre-hospital is the first contact typically an injured child has. That is 911. And one of the challenges, particularly across this country, is that not every EMS system has the same resources. We still have many services across the United States that are volunteer-based. Sure. Uh, and My those history. services don't have the resources for the education or the specialized equipment needed to care for mm -hmm. children. And so Kentucky is one of those states that has some challenges, obviously. And we have taken PEP, which is the Pediatric Education for Pre-Hospital Professionals, and the Emergency Nursing Pediatric course, both to, the, to these rural communities, Good. actually help with that education. And then the state partnership grants have allowed them to buy the specialized equipment they need to take care of those children. And receiving those children in my emergency department, I can tell you they're arriving in better condition. Sure they are. That makes a lot of sense. And can you state in your testimony that pediatric patients are simply not little adults, as many people might assume, and they require very specific types of, of care um, and, and certainly specific equipment unique yes. to, to children and dosages on a medication. Can you provide some examples of how diseases and injuries uh, uniquely manifest themselves differently in children? Absolutely. So there's, um, I'll take injuries to start with. Number one, one of the things that's very different, um, if any of you have been in a car crash and you were pulled, taken out of your car and put on a board or some type of an immobilization device and you lay flat, children have a larger head and they can't do that. If you lay them flat on a board, it will compromise their airway. So we have to put a pad under their shoulder so that their spine is maintained in a neutral position and their airway, which is very pliable and thin, unlike ours that's more rigid and cartilaginous, um, it will collapse. And so that's a perfect example there. The other problem is in, in illnesses, children can't tell you, particularly nonverbal small children, where, where their hurt is. They right. may cry if you touch it, but they may not be able to tell you that they have a sore throat or that their eardrum is bulging, which, you know, untreated ear infections can lead to meningitis. Sure. So there's certainly many challenges right. that can occur. Thank you very much, all of you, for the work you do and for your testimony today. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, this is what's so wonderful about hearings. We just keep learning and learning from the experts in our country. Uh, we're so grateful to you. Um, I now would like to recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to the four witnesses for, for your testimony today. You know, the, uh, the chair is absolutely right. Every time we have a hearing like this, we just learn more and more and more. And we go home and, and reach out to constituents and, and, and make community visits, and we learn even more. And so, um, you know, we just hear about examples after examples after examples in, in our home districts. Uh, the opioid crisis has not limited itself to affecting uh, only adults. We've, we've all heard stories about student athletes, for example, who might be treated for sports-related injury and find themselves caught in the grip of opioid abuse. Children and adolescents are not immune uh, from the reach of addiction and substance abuse, which can sometimes lead to emergency situations where immediate care is needed. So, Dr. Howard, let me stay with you if I can. Dr. Howard, can you tell us about how the EMS has aided in helping emergency care providers identify adolescents for opioid or other substance abuse? So, PCARN that I mentioned earlier that does yes. the research has actually looked at some of the programs in terms of being able to how, how adolescents in particular present differently clinically than adults do with addiction. It's the, the symptoms and the presentation are not the same. So that's a very specific example of the work that this particular program has been able to do to make a difference for children and the opioid crisis. And how does this identification improve follow-up care and treatment after these young people make it through the emergency? Well, the first step to treatment is recognizing it, and so being able to recognize it in the emergency department, which is not something even 10 years ago we would have looked for. So once we recognize it, we can make sure they're connected to care, make sure that warm handoff occurs as is appropriate. We can't always assume that the, those that care for them are going to get them to that next step, so we have to make sure that those 
connections are made in the emergency department so that they can be safe. Absolutely. Uh, there is no doubt that newborn screening is a vital preventive public health service that has led to better health outcomes for thousands, if not millions, of children. The Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act has dramatically improved the capacity for states to expand newborn screening services, and I fully support uh, its reauthorization. I was glad to see that the reauthorization bill that we are considering includes, it includes a study on how we can modernize newborn screening as our capabilities for treating and screening for conditions expand. I think it's important that our infrastructure also keeps pace. Uh, Dr. Bocchini, uh, let me ask you please, can you explain the role that public health labs play in the newborn screening program and how public health lab capacity plays a role in determining what conditions a state might be able to screen? So um, the newborn screening program is a state-based public health program, and so each state has the responsibility of putting together uh, the laboratory that performs the testing that's necessary to uh, screen, um, and then in many cases do the diagnostic test to confirm that a, an individual has a specific diagnosis. The capacity of state labs uh, do, does vary uh, from state to state, um, and when we bring new conditions uh, into the RUSP, it does create the requirement that a state, state lab may have to modify uh, its program. It may have to bring in new personnel. It may have to bring in new equipment. But in addition, the, the state program uh, not only has the lab requirements, but it also has to develop the ability to not only identify the patients, but get them to appropriate therapy for short-term follow-up and long-term follow-up. So um, there is a variation in the capacity of individual states to provide the um, infrastructure that's needed. And so the, the, um, the grants that can come from HRSA um, and the efforts from the CDC can help individual state labs meet the requirements that are necessary for them to bring on a new condition. That speaks to my next, next statement. In addition to, to lab capacity that we're talking about, we also want to make sure that a diagnosed child is able to receive adequate treatment. And, and, and as you know and I know, uh, under the law, HRSA is required to provide assistance to states on follow-up care once a newborn is diagnosed, right or wrong. That is correct, uh, both short-term and long-term follow-up. So we want to make sure that the child gets into the appropriate uh, subspecialist if necessary and initiates the appropriate therapy, but then maintains that so that we can look at what happens long-term in terms of the effectiveness of the therapy and the ability to maintain that child in the program. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and, and welcome to you all. We're glad to have you here. And I'm going to follow up first with, uh, I know Dr. Burgess touched on this issue with Dr. Bucchini, but I want to turn to Dr. Hewitt um, on, on the same issue. You know, I've worked on this genomic sequencing as a diagnostic tool for a couple years now, and uh, you noted that the pre the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder diagnosis has risen uh, dramatically over 600 percent in the past several decades, but it seems like we still lack a certain degree of precision when it comes to diagnosing autism spectrum disorder. I realize that there are different uh, schools of thought on the applicability of genetic diagnosis, but I'm curious of your thoughts on the role this technology can play in, in two areas. Uh, first, on the diagnostic end, and secondly, on the therapeutic side. Certainly, that's that's a really good question, and I would defer the answer to my colleagues who are doing that kind of research. I'm I'm not that I'm not a geneticist, and I'm not doing genetic research, so I'd be happy to get you um, expert information about that um, at a later time. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Bikini. Uh, uh, you also mentioned uh, genomic diagnostics as having the potential to significantly alter newborn screening. So I'd like to hear more on your thoughts on the role this technology can play. A lot of us on this committee, uh, based upon the 21st Century Cures, know this, this young little rascal. His name is Max, and he was like the number one 
lobbyist for uh, 21st Century Cures. This was at the, the bill signing at the White House uh, with Joe Pitts uh, behind. Uh, Max is putting bunny, bunny ears behind my head. I'm putting them behind his. Uh, his issue was a, um, a blood disorder that had they not delayed uh, a tonsillectomy, he could have bled to death. Which, which, uh, this, which was an undiagnosed bleeding disorder, uh, could have been disastrous, uh, as, as I had mentioned. But as Max and millions of other children uh, have told us, we shouldn't rely on luck or, quote, unquote, this diagnostic odyssey uh, to ensure the best medical outcomes are achieved. Um, I'd like, Dr. Kenny, if you could uh, expand in your your in your uh, prepared statement. In the end, you you uh, you say, in addition, as scientific advances, the ability to utilize new technologies such as genomic sequencing are evaluated. Additional research, ethical, and clinical questions will need to be answered, and that's part of our internal debate of how we address this. These technical advances could significantly alter the approach to newborn screening in the coming years. And then you end. So I'd like for you to elaborate on that as I think it's really um, timely in, in the things that we're, I'm trying to do uh, in the public policy arena. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, I think it's a very important one. Uh, genomic sequencing can certainly identify a number of uh, genetic uh, changes that uh, could be very specifically associated with underlying uh, disorders. Um, and actually, this has been recognized through the, the Hunter Kelly um, uh, uh, research program at NIH. There are three, um, and we don't know how it will ultimately affect newborn screening, but we're in the process of determining um, how it might affect it. Um, the NIH, through the program, has three research projects underway now looking at comparing the genomic uh, screening, exome screening, to root the current of uh, screening for, um, uh, for infants um, in uh, general population and in the population of infants in the NICU with critical uh, illnesses. Um, those studies will inform us on the potential benefit of moving towards uh, genomic sequencing as part of newborn screening. Um, thank you very much. And I'm just going to end on here's a perfect example of kids being involved. I visited a school called, it's pronounced, it's spelled Hoopston, but it's really pronounced Hupston. And I had, after the event, I had three high school, uh, Anna Lynn Schomburg, Raven Rutherford, and Seth Mershon hand me a letter asking me to support this bill. So uh, that was true youth in action, and I appreciate that, and I want to give them credit because I then came back, looked at the bill, and got on it. So with that, thank you for your time, Madam Chairman. I yield back my nine seconds. And I'll use part of that to say thank God for the advocates, right? Uh, I now have the pleasure of recognizing the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor, for her five minutes of questioning. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Eshoo, for holding this hearing on the, this uh, important package of, of bills, and thank you to our experts for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, I'm pleased that we're taking up these bills, and I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of the Autism Cares Act and the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act. And I want to thank the chair again for including my bill in this hearing, H.R. 776, the Emergency Medical Services for Children uh, Program re Reauthorization, which I introduced with uh, Representatives P Peter King, Representative Butterfield, uh, Representative Chris Stewart. Our bill will reauthorize the emergency medical services for children uh, through 2024. And EMSC is vital because it is the only federal funding specifically focused on addressing the unique needs of children in the emergency services systems. Uh, as Dr. Kunz Howard has uh, stated very clearly, kids have specific health care needs. And EMSC helps bring innovation to, in pediatric emergency care to each state. In 2016, 22 percent, that's about 2 million, of emergency department visits in my home state of Florida were made by children. Uh, so the, we, we must reauthorize this initiative as soon as possible to ensure America's kids are getting the right care when, when they need it. Uh, Florida is using its funds through the state 
partnership grant to work on a collaborative project with, uh, it's called the Florida P Pediatric Preparedness and Readiness Program, PED Ready, for hospitals and EMS. Uh, they're working with national and state groups, including the National and Florida Emergency Nurses Association and the Florida College of Emergency Physicians. Florida PED Ready is a quality improvement initiative with the goal of improving the readiness of medical facilities to care for children across the state with a focus on non-children's hospitals and EMS agencies. Uh, they did a needs assessment uh, in uh, 2018, so last year, and here are some of the findings from the survey. Pediatric equipment. Mo most significant challenges include keeping the correct equipment or size stocked and knowing the most current pediatric equipment available on the market. Medication. Uh, most challenging pediatric medications are the vasopressor, drips, and emergency airway medications, and I believe you mentioned those as well. Uh, top educational needs are emergencies, pediatric trauma, and burns. Uh, Dr. Kunz Howard, you also talked a little bit about the importance of uh, pre-hospital care. Uh, you've seen firsthand how important ESMC or EMSC has been to providing better, more accurate care to our nation's kids. Uh, reiterate why it's important to have a kind of standalone uh, funding that's specifically targeted back to our home communities to make sure that we're modern and kids stay well. It's really critical that it be targeted back to the home communities because that is where the children are. We need children to receive the care no matter what location they are in across the United States. We need to know that every area is going to be pediatric ready, and that is really what EMSC is about, is ensuring pediatric readiness. And so it is critical that everyone everywhere or across this country knows that if their child is ill or injured, they don't have to think, oh gosh, I've got to get to the next county so that my child gets the care that they need. That's not what they need to worry about. They need to worry about supporting their child and being there for them. What are your hopes uh, for this initiative going forward now that we've had a number of years of continuity and with this reauthorization, uh, local communities will be able to plan more? Honestly, my hopes is that every emergency department would be pediatric ready because they are not. I mean, the survey showed us that not every emergency department is pediatric ready. And so we worry about pre-hospital because their care is critical because if their job is not done right, our job is much harder. But we need that to be across that continuum of emergency care, both pre-hospital readiness as well as emergency department readiness. Thank you very much. And I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, uh, Mr. Guthrie, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, and thank you for all being here, particularly Dr. Howard. Thanks for coming up from the Commonwealth today to be with us, and, and always enjoy having you in Washington, D.C., and, and bringing to attention the areas in which you focus on, and it's all, always so important, particularly on the Emergency Medical Services for Children program. I know that you're the educator for the, our Lexington Division of Fire and Emergency Services. I'm close with our MS folks down in Bowling Green, Gary Madison. I know you know those guys down there that, that work hard. Would you uh, just explain how this program uh, supports courses that have saved children's lives and maybe some examples of how this program and your education of these uh, great men and women in our emergency services have saved lives because of what you've done? Well, you know, I've been very fortunate to be able to go across Kentucky because of the EMSC program and teach um, paramedics specifically as well as nurses and physicians um, what is appropriate for pediatric emergency care. So we have been to Pikeville and we have been to uh, Paducah. So we've been, you know, from one end of the state to the other to actually make sure that PEP is available because the pediatric education for pre-hospital professionals is really a phenomenal course. And one of the nicest things about that course is that it was de developed collaboratively, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Emergency Nurses Association, the American College of Emergency Physicians, and then some of the EMS agencies. We all worked together so that we would all talk the same language because that is one of the challenges in care is the physicians will learn one thing, the nurses learn another, and the pre-hospital professionals learn something different, but we all use something called the pediatric triangle mm -hmm. to do that initial assessment of the child to make that common language so that we all have the same starting place, so we all recognize the same framework for how sick that child is. And so I think that's the, one of the best examples of the work that's been done um, as part of EMSC is making sure we're all talking the same language about the ill or injured child. Okay, thank you very much. 
Dr. Bikini, we, um, I got involved in early childhood screen or newborn screening when I was in the state legislature for hearing. Uh, we learned uh, Governor Patton, who was our governor at the time, uh, championed it that if a child just has hearing issues and, you, and you're able to find it in five years old and, and fix the issue or, or give them ability to hear better, they're going to lose things they can never recover, like pronouncing certain words and things like that. So we thought it was important to do that at early childhood, I mean at newborn. And we have a lot of groups that come here and talk about the issues, and, and they're all important and they're all valuable and, and why we don't test for everything. You know, one is just at the cost that it moves forward. So could you kind of say for us, um, I know that six new conditions have been added for the recommended. So when groups appoint us, what should we be looking for? How this is something that we need to be screening for a child. How, how does that, as conditions change, as medicine changes so quickly, how do we know how to change this screening in a timely manner? Your uh, microphone. The microphone, yeah. I'm sorry, I turned it off. Um, the advisory committee has developed a very specific approach to uh, bring co conditions for evaluation. Um, it starts off with uh, uh, working with um, advocacy groups, researchers, um, organizations that um, have a particular uh, condition which they're interested in or have the development through research of a potential screening test or a therapy um, and uh, try to work with them to put together a nomination um, packet of information that would meet the standards for which the committee would review that condition for consideration of being placed on the RUSP. Uh, then the most important thing the committee does is um, when accepting that nomination the, 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 uh, for a condition, uh, there is an independent, independent evidence review committee that does a formal evaluation of all the evidence uh, related to the condition and the, the benefits of treatment. And so uh, the goal of the committee is to look for a condition that we have a degree of certainty, uh, if it's added to the RUSP, will provide a net benefit for the patient or for the child that is affected. So we have a, a, a very formal uh, way to um, bring people together um, and evaluate the condition, and then based on the evidence review, um, make a decision about whether the condition should be added to the RUSP. We make that recommendation to the secretary. Secretary of HHS has the final decision for acceptance uh, of our recommendation. Uh, once the secretary accepts it, it's, uh, it becomes part of the RUSP. Um, uh, so it's a, a very significant evidence-based process that leads us to bring conditions forward. Um, we also are paying attention to where changes are being made, where, where breakthrough therapy might become available, uh, so that we can kind of um, look forward to uh, bringing conditions on. Thank you very much. My time's expired, and I yield back. Thank you for your answers. Appreciate it. The gentleman um, yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, is recognized for five minutes uh, for his questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, all of you, for your testimony today on these very, very important public health programs and need for us to maintain them. Um, I wanted to talk, um, Ms. Kagan, to you about the respite care issue. And I, I wondered if you could maybe um, pull us back a little bit and, and try to give us a sense of how the supply of these um, critical support services is meeting demand. I know when I came in earlier, you were, I think, talking with um, Congressman Eshoo a little bit about that. And give us a sense, and I know it's hard to quantify this, but try to describe what the gap is between the need for this and the demand uh, rather need for this and the supply for it. I'm also curious in the same vein, if we looked five years ago and then 10 years ago, just picking that time frame if that works, um, how much progress we've made in, in meeting the demand for these services. So if you could speak to that, then I have a couple follow-up questions. Yeah, absolutely. I, <clears throat> I did include in my testimony, and we don't have really great data um, on who needs respite and who's getting it, but there was the survey done by AARP and the National Alliance for Caregiving several years ago that demonstrated 85% of family caregivers of adults 
are not accessing respite, and we know all of the reasons why. Um, shortage of services, no ability to pay for services, but even when families have the dollars to pay for respite, they cannot find the providers. Um, one great example of how this is being dealt with in lifespan respite is in Maryland. Um, they received a, a one-time grant in 2015 and they jumped right into providing emergency respite services, which were, they identified to be in critically short supply in the state. But rather than just giving families the voucher dollars to pay for emergency respite, because that doesn't do a family much good if they can't find a provider uh, on short notice. So they also contracted statewide with a home health agency that would be available to provide those respite providers on less than 24 hours notice. Um, so we have to not only build up the system so that we can support family caregivers to pay for dollars, but address the provider shortage uh, as well. And it's not just individual providers. We need community and faith-based programs um, to step up as well. Things I think over you've asked over the last five to 10 years, um, in some ways it's gotten a little bit worse. <laughs> um, and, and that's also because of the changing demographics. Um, from my understanding of some of the AARP data, especially for older adults over age 85, uh, currently, there are seven people in the age range that can provide care to those over 85. In 10 years or less, the, the ratio is going to be more like two to one. So to actually even have the physical bodies to provide this care, and it's not just in the respite field, of course, it's the direct service workforce uh, across the board. So we, we're facing bigger challenges, but we are moving forward uh, in terms of recruiting and training new providers. Um, states like North Carolina have, have partnered with uh, Money Follows the Person programs or other programs to, to work on statewide direct service workforce issues. Um, so our, our programs are working in conjunction with those who are trying to deal with the crisis. And, and so that kind of leads me to another question, which is obviously the flexibility of the, the grants that go to the states are, are allowing for a lot of different um, approaches to be <clears throat> tested. Are there some best practices emerging, some approaches that are the ones we should maybe be providing more support for as we go forward? Are we still really kind of in an experimental stage and there's a lot of different things being considered, all of which show promise or a substantial number of which show promise? Or, or if you were kind of betting on what would emerge as um, the approach that, that's got the most promise um, going forward, what would you say to that? Uh, again, that's a little bit of a difficult question because the respite needs of families are as varied as the models yeah. that should be out there for delivering it. Uh, I think one successful model that most states have been using is use of the consumer-directed voucher that allows families to choose who they want for their provider, when they will hire them, how they will train them. Um, that that there's been some research that shows family caregivers are most satisfied with that approach if they have mm -hmm. control uh, over who they're hiring, when they're hiring, and uh, how they use the respite services. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of wonderful models that are helping us expand capacity through faith-based communities. Uh, in Rhode Island, they uh, have developed a student respite initiative, uh, which uses nursing students to uh, provide respite services, and in return for that, they're getting course credit and clinical uh, experience. Um, and that's been so successful in Rhode Island, they've expanded it uh, this past year to two additional nursing programs. And there are several other states that are, are using these students uh, to build respite services as well. Right. So that, along with uh, volunteer respite uh, opportunities, um, New York has trained over 100 uh, companion respite volunteers. Uh, that are serving families in 26 counties across the state. So there, there are a lot of wonderful models. Some of these efforts right now, because the funding is so small, the efforts are very tiny. Um, but it's giving us a chance to see what families uh, prefer and what they're willing to use as well. Very helpful. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman kneels back. We went about a minute over, but I wanted to hear every word you said, so I didn't want to tap the gavel. Um, now, uh, you know, our subcommittee is blessed with having um, physicians as, uh, uh, as members of it, but we also have the only pharmacist in the, in the Congress that's part of our committee. He's the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Carter. 
recognized for five minutes for his questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for being here. Certainly, these are important uh, pieces of legislation that we need to, to take care of, and we appreciate your help in, in helping us move them forward. Dr. Hewitt, I want to start with you. I I'm, I'm want to just say that I'm very proud of um, the Children's Hospital of Atlanta's Marcus Center for Autism. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to visit. I have, and, and it's certainly, I think, just world class. I, I was so impressed. It has um, treated more than 40,000 children since it was open, and it's one of the largest autism centers in the U.S., and we're just blessed to have it in, in Georgia and blessed to have um, the Marcus family as, as beneficiaries and, and helping us with that. They've done great things in the state of Georgia. But the Marcus Center is one of the five centers of excellence in the country. What, what constitutes, what makes it a center of excellence, and what's the difference there? Well, a, a big part of it is where the funding comes from, um, the autism centers of, and, and then the action that happens in those centers. So the autism centers of excellence are known for research, and that research varies. Some of it is um, very clinically oriented. Some of it is what, what we would call more bench science uh, kinds of, of research. But this, the center of excellence concept is that you're doing important research that leads to changes in practice and policy. One of the things that I was impressed most with was uh, their emphasis on early intervention. How important is that, and, and what difference does that make? The, sci the science is very clear that early intervention matters, and children will have better educational outcomes, they'll have better uh, lifetime outcomes the earlier in which they receive a diagnosis and get intervention. And so that's why there's such an important focus in many of the autism care's uh, programs around early intervention and treatment. I remember when I was there, they, they showed me this, this new diagnosis, if you will, when, where they were measuring um, um, early detection devices that measured eye movements, and, and that was to help screen for autism. Are you familiar with that? I'm vaguely familiar with that. Okay. What, just, just out of curiosity, what, what are some of the biggest breakthroughs that we've seen in autism? I, you know, it's, it's, it's such a problem, and, and we're, it's such difficult, uh, to, so difficult, I should say, to, to really break through. What are some of the big breakthroughs that we've seen? I, I, I think one of the important things is just to remember that autism is complex, and autism is unique for each individual. Um, an, an emerging breakthrough is really around uh, what we're learning from brain Im imaging and being able to identify autism in very, very young children. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, and, and that again is uh, an outcome of the research that uh, CARES and other programs are investing in. So obviously research is extremely important in this, and, and the, the funds that come from Autism Cares are, are extremely important in the research part of it. They're, they're extremely important. I think expansion into adult-related interventions is, is an, extra, an, an important next horizon. Good, good. Well, again, I just wanted to, to be able to, to, to tell and, and to speak about the Marcus Center because we're so proud of it in the state of Georgia and just the, the work that is being done there, as I say, I, I've witnessed it firsthand and I've seen it and it is phenomenal. We're very, very happy to, and very proud to have it in the state of Georgia. Again, thank all of you for being here. This is extremely important. Now I'll yield back the remaining time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I now would like to recognize the gentlewoman from New Hampshire, Ms. Custer, for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairwoman Eshoo, for holding this important hearing and for giving us the opportunity to discuss legislation critical to funding programs supporting newborns, children with autism spectrum disorder, and other intellectual disabilities, and family caregivers. And just as an aside, I was a family caregiver with my father for my uh, late mother who had Alzheimer's disease. And uh, we were very grateful for the respite care. Uh, eventually, he just ran himself right into the ground. And I can remember friends coming up on the street saying, is your father OK? And I said, no, he's not OK at all. He ended up needing hip surgery. And he was just exhausted. But he didn't want to see a 53-year marriage let it go. And when I finally, he had to go to the hospital for the hip surgery. And we were going over uh, her care 
during uh, in respite, and uh, he said, wow, I'm going to have a hard time taking care of her when I get home from surgery. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, I think that'll be impossible. So that was when we finally got him to get her into uh, nursing home care. And I, my heart is with all the families that are working on this. Um, in my home state of New York, the Leadership Education Neurodevelopmental Disorders Program at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center provides Granite Staters with workforce training and family-centered services for patients with autism spectrum disorder. And this funding is critical, as you can imagine, in a rural community to ensure patients and families access to support. Um, what we've heard today is a snapshot of how these different programs truly save lives. And I want to thank everyone on the committee for bipartisan legislation. It's noteworthy and important. With that, I want to jump into the questions. Dr. Hewitt, you described a, a vast array of funding through CARES, and we have many of those same uh, programs. Autism is the, in the name, but the training and research touches people across the disability spectrum. And I think it's important for us to understand how comprehensive the CARES program is. Could you elaborate on how CARES serves uh, families, uh, patients with autism and intellectual abilities and the full spectrum? Sure, the training programs that are funded through CARES, the LEND training programs, the developmental behavioral pediatrician programs, they're really targeted to focus on the range of neurodevelopmental disabilities. So autism is a part of that, but they expand into many other categorical groups of disabilities, cerebral palsy, um, hydrocephalus, spina bifida, Tourette syndrome, I could go on and on and on. And so in our training programs, we're not charged with just developing leaders who are going to change services and practices and policy related specifically to autism. It's an important focus of our programs, but autism is one of many neurodevelopmental disabilities on which our training programs focus. So and the key changes in the bill that we're discussing today address the needs of adults in geographically underrepresented areas. How does CARES funding support the workforce so that there are enough properly trained providers to address the needs of this community? I, I think that's a really important step uh, in the reauthorization. Specifically in the developmental behavioral pediatrics um, program, there is a requirement that those training programs reach developmental behavioral pediatricians in rural communities. In our LEND programs, we are, are expected to reach our entire state. So for example, our program is in metropolitan um, area, large metropolitan area, but we're expected to be able to have a statewide reach throughout our entire state. And can you speak to what might happen if continued federal support was not available? I think, I think a theme across all four of the uh, people here to testify today has been workforce. And in all of our areas of specialty, we have workforce shortages. And without reauthorization, the specific training programs that help to evolve the expertise in nurses, in occupational therapists, social workers, geneticists, like on and on, um, it's just not there. People don't get that training in their specific discipline, let alone an interdisciplinary perspective around these critical issues. So I, I think one of the, the biggest um, drawbacks will be the lack of professional training that is targeted and specific on um, specific disability groups, specific genetic disorders, et cetera. Well, my time is up, but I can certainly say in a state with 2.4% unemployment, th this federal funding will be critical. So thank you, I yield back. The gentlewoman uh, yields back, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Bocchini, uh, I got just a couple questions for you. Uh, what is, what's the process for adding a, a new test to the new board screening? So um, <clears throat> the, the test um, that, so the a screening test um, would um, need to have the um, um, 
laboratory performance characteristics that would enable it to identify uh, the uh, majority of patients who have a disorder and not have a number of false positive tests that would create um, a need for evaluating a number of patients who do not have the disorder. So that would mean that um, we need to know whether a screening test would perform adequately within a rapid, high-performance newborn screening laboratory. How long does that total time frame take? Well, it takes pilot studies, and one of the things that this committee, our committee, advisory committee needs is adequate number of pilot studies. It, depending on the size of the pilot studies, it may take um, a year, a year or more, multiple years, uh, to prove that a test performs adequately to identify the patients that we need to so that um, the, um, there, there is not excess cost, um, excess number of false positives that would potentially create harm uh, for the patient. What's the percentages are, that are acceptable? I mean, do you, we say not a, is it a 5% failure rate, 3%, 1%? Well, um, probably um, it, it varies from uh, test to test, but uh, the goal would be to have that down to as few as possible, so it would be probably much less than 3%. Much less than 3 um, it, You mentioned in your testimony that six additional conditions were recommended for inclusion on the um, recommended uniform screening panel. Yeah. Do we normally see savings in a Medicaid or CHIP system when we add tests? Yes, um, those, um, one of the advantages of having a public health system is that um, there would be no health disparities um, related to the ability to get tested. Um, and then there, there is really an important uh, requirement that the treatment that um, is necessary for us to even consider a condition is available to everyone. So that would include CHIP or uh, Medicaid. Some of the studies that we've seen is that the providers, the primary care physicians, they're not real familiar, real comfortable with recommending uh, these tests or what to do with them when they have certain tests screened and where to send the individuals. Are we looking at trying to educate the primary care person? How are we, how are we trying to educate, especially the individuals that are maybe been in the field for a while versus the ones that are, that are entering the field? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question because um, as things evolve, uh, primary care practitioners need to be much more aware of and how to deal with um, the genetic-related conditions that are being found in the newborn period. So um, the advisory committee does have an education and training work group um, that um, addresses the education of everyone involved in newborn screening. That would be providers, the public. Um, uh, as, as well as uh, the laboratorians that, that might need the information. So there is a significant effort to train or, and educate individuals. Um, uh, the uh, Medical College of Medical, uh, Medical Genetics um, has a series of statements that are available to uh, state uh, newborn screening programs that can be given to providers when a diagnosis, when a screening test is abnormal. Uh, so that they can then have the information they need to advise parents of the next steps. Are, uh, is there an effort to include this training in some of their continuing education that's required each year? There, yes. Um, in fact, uh, there are quality improvement projects, one from the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, that are, is available uh, to all uh, primary care pediatricians, um, as well as other programs as well in individual states. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Um, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Illinois, uh, Ms. Kelly, for her five minutes of question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all the witnesses. Dr. Hewitt, I just wanted to ask you, um, because something personal just happened uh, in my life, my godson, who's like a year and maybe three or four months, his mom was just told, that they think he has autism. And uh, I wondered, you know, what signs did he show that made them think that? Because he seems like a healthy, um, lively baby boy. 
Sure, so, so one of the things about autism that's important for all of the subcommittee members to, to recognize is there isn't a blood test you can take, there isn't a genetic screening you can use right now to identify autism. And so clinical staff, teachers, um, therapists are looking, they're observing um, for characteristics. And some of those common characteristics are related to communication skills, um, social skills, behavioral interactions. And so likely somebody saw um, some of those common characteristics related to communication, socialization that uh, were of concern. It's interesting what happened this hearing now because the mother is actually getting him tested today. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I was just uh, curious. Um, and his mother's fortunate to be, for, for him to be the age he mm -hmm. is and to be getting into a test. Mm -hmm. um, a diagnostic test so soon. Mm -hmm. And she's very... It's really positive. So I know he'll be well taken care of. But, but thank you for your testimony. Um, Dr. Howard, can you illustrate for us what the scope of services would look like should Congress not act to protect the EMSC program? Um, it would be devastating. It would be very bad for many communities across the country. It would be challenging to smaller rural emergency departments that don't have a lot of resources where the resources are honestly needed the most is in the places where they have the fewest resources to start with. Um, it would mean that children would not arrive at referral facilities in quite as good of condition as they're arriving in presently, and so it will compromise their outcomes. And so it, it would be very devastating for the health and well-being of children across this country. And then, um, even though we're here for the children, not only the children, but the providers and the researchers. Absolutely. The providers and, and all of the clinical care providers from pre-hospital, you know, through physicians, even honestly beyond the, the continuum of emergency care, it, it even extends throughout that entire visit. It would be much more challenging for all, and there would be a loss of training for those in the pre-hospital and emergency world, yes. Even though this is my first Congress on this committee, this committee has a long history of focusing on improving treatment and care for mental health, including improving care for children. And in your testimony, you mentioned that the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network funded by the Emergency Medical Services for Children's Program has improved mental health screening of children in emergency situations. Can you discuss how this mental health screening tool was developed? And how it has helped. Uh, so I, I don't know. Care for children. I, I don't know that I can talk about the specific tool, but what I can tell you is that we screen children in emergency departments now for behavioral health conditions, which is not something that we always did because there's been this heightened awareness. Um, part of it being through the MSC program. So we are much more cognizant of mental health screening for all ages of children. You know, for many years we didn't assess children for suicidality until they were 12, and now we assess at five years of age. And that can be complicated to talk, talk to children and parents about do they have, have, have they expressed any desire to harm themselves or are they doing self-harm behaviors. And so that's really important, and not everybody knows to do that without programs like EMSC. And there's still, um, even though we're in 2019, such a stigma still around uh, mental health. Unfortunately, yes, there is still a stigma, but the reality is that is an illness like every other illness we take care of. There should be no stigma. We don't stigmatize children for having pediatric cancer. We shouldn't stigmatize them for having pediatric mental health disorders. Right. I have a master's in counseling. I <laughs> totally agree with you. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman yields back, and uh, it's a pleasure for the chair to recognize the gentlewoman from Indiana, Ms. Brooks, for her five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, uh, and thank you all so very, very much for your expertise, for your passion, uh, for your patience, and for everyone that you're working with from the young to the older uh, citizens among us. Um, Dr. Howard, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about the inter-facility transfer guidelines um, that obviously allow for the optimal selection of a hospital that can care for pediatric uh, and transport of pediatric patients, but yet you've shared that only 50% of the hospitals in your written testimony have taken up these guidelines. Um, can you talk with us, what are the barriers that might exist as to why more hospitals don't utilize the guidelines? And well, why, might, why aren't they appropriate for all hospitals? Well, they actually are appropriate for all hospitals. 
Um, now, referral, the main referral centers aren't really going to transfer children out, obviously. These are going to be the places that are going to refer into us, into large academic centers that have all the resources available. Um, and really one of the barriers still is knowledge, training, and education. For as much as we've made great inroads in actually providing this information to places across the country, there still remain gaps in this knowledge, and there are still um, some Excuse challenges. Excuse me, can I ask a question about that? Gaps in the knowledge, whose knowledge? Is it the physicians in other hospitals and nurses in other hospitals not knowing when to transfer a child? In Indiana, might be the Riley Children's Hospital, where I believe Dr. Hewitt trained. I mean, why, how do physicians and or nurses in a state not have that knowledge as to where a pediatric patient should be most appropriately treated? Well, the reality is not every emergency physician is emergency medicine trained. Um, many facilities um, around the country, particularly smaller areas, have what we call locum tenens emergency physicians, and so they may not be aware of the care network because they're there for a short time. And so having those standardized programs and guidelines already set and in place by the facility is critical because if that standard work is there, it makes a difference for when you have that revolving door because many of these small rural communities, it's hard to get people to want to stay there and practice. And so when you refer to the arrangement, these are with out-of-state physicians often coming in for periods of time and working in ERs, is that correct? That's, it's very common, particularly um, in, in rural. small rural areas. I mean, that certainly ha happens in southeastern Kentucky. Um, we have many locum tenens emergency physicians that are not vested in the community, they don't understand the networks, they don't have the relationships with referral centers, and they're just like, well, send them to the next place. Well, sending them to the next place isn't really where they need to go because the next place might have more resources, but they don't have all the resources. Okay. Do you have any suggestions over what we can do to improve the state um, partnership grants? Uh, well, I mean, my first recommendation would be that they, of course, could use more money, but I'll be just be happy if they're reauthorized where they are today okay. uh, because we all believe all of our passions could use more money to be able to <laughs> allow for more training and education. <laughs> okay, thank you. Ask for more, don't say. <laughs> Keep it the same. Yeah. Do Dr. Hewitt, um, <laughs> speaking of Riley Hospital, and I um, want to talk a little bit about how do families find out about the LEND programs that you've been talking about. How, do, how does a family learn about it? So LEND programs across, across our nation and in our territories um, have as a responsibility to have families as faculty. It's a unique component. So as our training faculty, we have family members and we have people with lived experience of disability. And we're partnering with family networks. So that could be Family Voices, it could be the ARC, it could be uh, the parent-to-parent -parent training centers in each and every state, and our Title V program. So we're well-networked in our partnerships to be able to reach through organizations that reach families, and then family to family by having faculty and trainees who are family members in our programs. Uh, you referred to your brother-in-law. What do the services look like for adults with aut autism spectrum disorder versus children? It's a challenge. It varies by state. Another theme that you've, you've heard from us today. Um, many states in their developmental disability systems have related conditions clauses, which allows for somebody who has autism to be served in their developmental disability program. Not all states have those clauses, so sometimes um, youth and adults with autism, once they're out of school, don't have access to developmental disability services. Any idea how many states don't have that clause? I do, I do know that data. I don't have it okay. at the top of my head, but I'll send it Thank to you. you. When there's a related conditions clause, most people with autism who are adults are served through the developmental disability system. The challenge there is the primary program is home and community-based services, and as you, you may know, there are waiting lists in most states for those services. That's the primary mechanism. Some services through vocational rehabilitation for employment. Thank you. My, I've exceeded my time. I'm sorry, and I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. Uh, I, the chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Delaware, Ms. Blunt Rochester, for five minutes of her questions. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I first want to um, thank all of the panelists. You know, whenever um, issues come before us, I think it's important to put faces to those issues. And so um, as I thought about this opportunity to make sure that we highlight and support these important bills, I thought about faces in my life. Um, when you talk about lifespan respite care, uh, my mother's best friend for over 40 years um, is a caregiver to her daughter. Um, when you talk about family navigation, I think about so many families that are challenged with trying to navigate sometimes very complex systems at a very stressful time in their lives. Um, when you talk about the LEND program, um, I think about the fact that my last job before coming to Congress, I worked for um, the Institute for Community Inclusion at UMass Boston, which is also a USAID work, and the fact that evidence-based level everybody to take a minute to think about a face of a young person or an older person um, that is touched by this very important legislation. And so I thank you, Madam Chair, for, for the opportunity. Um, Autism Cares uh, has served as a catalyst for bringing people together in Delaware, critical stakeholders like uh, service providers, families, clinicians, and students uh, to discuss what's working, what's not working, and where we can go in the future. One of the core pieces of Autism Cares is support for early screening and identification of autism spectrum disorder, which is also an important area to foc of focus for my state of Delaware. In 2013, uh, we reported that the average age of diagnoses was 5.5 years old, but the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends screening start as early as 18 months of age. And even more troubling are the existing disparities in access to diagnostic and early intervention services for ASD. Because of a grant that uh, funded uh, Autism Cares, stakeholders came together to focus on and target Latino families in Sussex County who are living in medically underserved areas with limited access to providers and appropriate services. Uh, Dr. Hewitt, uh, my first question is, can you talk a little bit about um, the disparities that exist among um, di the early diagnosis and screening for minority populations, um, why they exist, and what kind of impact it would have? Certainly. It, it's really an interesting topic because in, in some communities and in some states, children from diverse ethnic, racial, linguistic backgrounds are underdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people make an assumption that the disparity is that children are overdiagnosed. But in, in our state, in, you know, we, we are underdiagnosing uh, Latino children um, and Native American children as well as African American children. So part of it is that access to early identification, access to early intervention, those kinds of, of young child um, programs. One of our charges as LEND programs is to address those disparities. So for example, in, in our last cohort of LEND trainees, one of our trainees' project was to be working in the mosques and, in, and trying to train um, the mosque um, families about autism, so trying to get into faith communities to um, help in identifying and getting information ab about how kids should be identified, and it shouldn't be a stigma to have autism. It should be considered like any other health issue where we identify it and get supports. Great. Um, I, I'm going to turn to to you, doctor. Is it Bocchini or Bokini, okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bokini, um, could you just briefly, I have like 40 seconds, um, and it's a lot, describe the difference between testing and screening, and also you mentioned in your testimony about the fact that in addition to the health, the great health outcomes, it is also cost savings. Can you share a little bit about those? So many of the conditions that we screen for, if untreated, will cause developmental delays. Uh, which then end up costing a significant amount to address and, and manage by early screening and a diagnosis before those permanent changes occur, you reduce those costs. So for many issues, that's, that's what happens. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Um, lastly, I'll submit questions for the record um, because I want to ask questions about the LEND program. I want to ask questions about uh, the respite care. So I will do that. But I want to thank you so much for all of your work on behalf of Americans. Thank you.
and I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Arrakis, Thank for you, his five you. minutes of questioning. Thank you so and very much. And for the, uh, all the advocates that are here, um, Congressman Bill Arrakis' uh, father uh, preceded him in the Congress, and he was chair of this subcommittee. So the tradition continues. Oh, You're recognized. We care a great deal about these issues, Madam Chair. Thank yeah. you, as you do, yeah. too. Thank you very much. I, well, I have some prepared questions, but I, I was looking into H.R. 2035, and uh, I wanted to, for, for the benefit of uh, the people listening back home, uh, tell me what it encompasses. I'm, I'm concerned specifically, is it Medicare, Medicaid patients, uh, uh, who are severely, uh, have severe illnesses. Uh, I'm also specifically concerned, do wounded warriors, I know it's mentioned in the, in the bill uh, with regard to wounded warriors, do they qualify for the respite care? In other words, their caregivers? Uh, that's so important as well, please. Uh, what's unique about Lifespan Respite Program is that there are no stringent eligibility criteria. So this enables the state to identify where the biggest gaps are in services and try to target their limited dollars to those individuals. So folks like wounded warriors, and there is a VA program for respite, but right. very often these individuals are either not qualifying for right. the VA program or there are not the types of respite options, especially the younger veterans, uh, where they're comfortable uh, getting respite services. So we have continued to partner, especially at the state level. The state respite coalitions have invited the VA caregiver coordinators to participate in their coalition so that they can uh, find additional respite resources for those individuals. Um, so again, there's not a specific targeting. Um, if, if a state is providing consumer-directed respite vouchers, they're very often targeting it to um, adults between the ages of 18 and 60 or with conditions like MS or ALS or uh, spinal cord injuries or adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities for whom no other respite services or public funding uh, sources exist. Uh, people with mental health issues where it's very hard to find respite services or dollars to support that. Uh, families who are on Medicaid waiver waiting lists uh, are often the first to be served under lifespan programs too. So it's really, it's the gap filling program. It's, it's those respite services. Um, families are, are eligible uh, if they're not getting services anywhere else from any other public program. I, very good. Uh, I, I, yes, yeah, so it's basically up to the states. Okay, uh, Dr. Bracchini, uh, as lead sponsor of the congenital heart uh, reauthorization Act, which is now law, and the co-chair of the Rare Disease Caucus. I certainly understand the importance of early screening and the critical chance and hope it affords patients and their care team. What's the current state of uh, newborn screening? Does it vary uh, from state to state? I, I, I want to ask this question specifically. Uh, I know it covers uh, hearing loss. In other words, you, the, the baby is screened for hearing loss. How about visual uh, impairment? Does it cover that as well? Visual impairment is not covered by newborn screening. Mm -hmm. We have to do something about that. Well, there, there are a number of things that um, are considered to be practice parameters that all babies are screened for in the newborn period by physicians um, and are not part of the public health program. Um, the public health program for newborn screening um, is, is really uh, dedicated to uh, things that can be done in a public health laboratory, um, as well as um, hearing screening and uh, conge critical congenital heart disease screening are point of care tests. And those are the only difference then other than um, the, the blood, heel stick blood test. Um, so uh, certain things would be considered normal practice parameters. Um, and out of the public health uh, realm. Okay, uh, so you answer most of my questions here. Uh, screening without proper follow-up actions is, is so very important. If you don't have the follow-up actions, it's basically moot. After an initial newborn screening identifies a condition, uh, patients or the caregiver in this case 
uh, the education options and resources become critical, especially in rural areas and low-income areas and medically underserved communities. Uh, what does that handoff currently look like? Is that room? Is there room for improvement uh, to follow up? Because that's so important as well. Uh, if you could uh, maybe elaborate a little bit, sir, that's important. That we follow up. Thank you. It's a very important question. <clears throat> Newborn screening is a program. It's really not a single test that's done in a laboratory. So it's very important that um, children who are identified are rapidly referred to um, the specialist or the individual who can then manage that child's care. So we would call that short-term follow-up. And then once short-term follow-up is assured, the diagnosis is made, um, and then the management is, is evolved, then long-term follow-up becomes really important so that that child's not lost to follow-up. Uh, yes, we can improve that. There are a lot of gaps that may exist in individual states based on resources, based on having enough subspecialty providers to take care of those patients, um, and then having the resources for the care that's needed uh, surrounding that specific diagnosis. So I think um, there is an opportunity with this uh, um, reauthorization to have more funds go to states uh, through the HRSA program to help improve short-term, long-term, especially long-term follow-up uh, of those patients. All right, very good. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you so the much. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair recognizes Dr. Ruiz from California for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all of you for coming today and testifying. Uh, the Emergency Medical Services for Children's Program helps train providers on how to coordinate care for kids in the emergency department. And when I first ran, I used to say, man, I don't care uh, if it's a Republican idea or if it's a Democratic idea. I just care if it's a darn good idea and I'm going to support it. This bill is, uh, has been introduced by Republican uh, Representative King. Uh, it's a hell of a good idea. I support this bill 100%. Um, and I believe Democratic uh, Representative Castor is on it, so it's a very good bipartisan bill. Uh, and I'll back any good idea from a Republican any day, any time. Uh, as an emergency department physician, I can assure you that it is critical that there are protocols set specifically for the unique needs of children. And it is not just important for physicians. My wife, Monica, is an emergency nurse, and I know you have a doctorate in nursing. Uh, Dr. Howard, and, uh, and she would say the same thing. So Dr. Howard, wh what are some examples of the models that have been developed for pre-hospital and hospital use, and how did this program help to do that, especially in terms of the regional care, EMS care for, for kids? Well, I, there's a variety of different examples, and I have alluded to the pediatric readiness a little bit earlier, and in fact, one of, uh, one of the members actually talked a little bit about what had happened in their state, but I think the pediatric readiness, which is some of the work that's really actually occurring presently, all the different pediatric readiness grants, is something that has really benefited all spectrums because it makes sure that not only is EMS ready, but the emergency department is ready with not just the knowledge, training, and expertise, but they also have dedicated physician and nurse champions for pediatric care, which is a little bit of a different focus than we've seen with some of the other EMSC programs. And so this pediatric readiness component, I think, is really critical. Dr. Howard, you know as well as I do that when you're in a rural emergency department or even an urban emergency department, uh, that when a very sick kid comes to you, everybody just tightens up a little. <laughs> and a lot of it is going to be quickly uh, stabilize, resuscitate, and then transfer to a tertiary children's hospital. And unfortunately, many locations in rural America, they don't have a, a nearby, and therefore they have to call uh, the medical flight uh, physicians and nurses to come and transport that critically sick patient to get life-saving care uh, where they need it. And m having grown up in a rural, impoverished uh, community of Coachella, California, that's very underserved, I've seen barriers to care that don't necessarily exist in non-rural settings, and those hospitals face a unique set of, uh, of needs. I've also uh, been a strong advocate for tribes in the Indian Health Service, uh, and who often face even greater access issues since long before I came to Congress. So, Dr. Uh, Howard, can you explain specifically how this program helps families living in underserved rural areas or tribal communities? 
it specifically helps those areas because the EMSC partnership grants have taken services to those rural areas. And I'll use my state for an example. We only have two level one children's facilities in our wow. entire state. So you either come what to Louisville or Lexington. What state is that again? I'm sorry. What state is Kentucky. that? Kentucky. Kentucky only has two children's hospitals for the entire state? Correct. And we, Man, we, we are not geographically large, but we are size-wise. It takes a significant amount of time. So if you come from far eastern Kentucky by helicopter, it's still almost an hour by flight. An hour when you're critically ill or injured and you've already had stabilization at another facility is challenging. I mean, that's why we got to protect the CHIP programs, the Medicaid programs for the children and, and families in Kentucky. You keep cutting those and putting on these work requirements, you're going to decrease the people that are insured. It's going to make things worse for the residents of Kentucky. So, uh, and we also have to make sure we fund those medical flights because without them, uh, time is tissue, right, in the emergency department. You don't get uh, the appropriate timely care for strokes and heart attacks, you're done. It's going to be much more costly in the future than, than the cost of a medical flight but because you're going to be paying for a lifetime of rehabilitation and loss of work. So this program includes the EMSC data center, which provides monitoring data management. Dr. Howard, what do we do with the data that we are collecting, and how does it improve uh, health outcomes for children in the emergency department setting? So the PCAR network has been phenomenal in terms of providing best evidence and shared that best evidence. And one of the things I mentioned in my oral testimony earlier is I think one of the best outcomes of that data, which is not getting a CAT scan on every child that presents to the emergency department for years. If you had a minor head injury and had a, were a loss of consciousness, you automatic CAT scan. We don't do that now. We observe these children. We have parameters. And so we're not, number one, unnecessarily exposing them to radiation, but we're also not spending dollars that we don't have to spend. And so that makes a difference. And these children do very well. Ms. Chair, I just want to uh, mention that she's absolutely correct that they found that kids who get these CAT scans are at higher risk of getting uh, leukemia, lymphomas, and other blood-borne cancers. And so now we're trying to really protect them from getting these, these CAT scans. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Yes. I just want to, uh, I can't help but add when you talked about uh, uh, air ambulances that we have to make sure that people don't suffer heart attacks when they get the bill for it. Um, the uh, chair now has the pleasure of recognizing the gentleman from Montana, uh, Mr. Gianforte. Thank you, Chairwoman Eshoo, and uh, thank you for the experts in your testimony today. These are very important topics. I'm a proud sponsor of the Autism Cares Act. I know funding for this program has been used to identify thousands of kids uh, who otherwise may not have been diagnosed as on the spectrum. Uh, we've seen nearly a fourfold increase in the number of students with autism receiving special education services in Montana schools in the last 10 years. Montana families rely on the services and support outlined in this bill. Currently, Montana is one of only a handful of states without their own LEND training program. Uh, but I know Montana is laying the groundwork to establish this uh, training within our state. This program is especially important in rural areas where it can be difficult to find providers uh, who can screen, diagnose, and help with the therapy needed. Over the last 12 years, Montanans have had to travel to Utah uh, to participate in the LEND program. I know it would really help our state to have more, a more local LEND program. Uh, Dr. Hewitt, uh, what challenges do children with autism face in rural communities? I was just in your state last week talking to them about gearing up for a LEN program. So they're, they're definitely gearing up for it. I, I think in answer to your question, the biggest challenge is having people with the training and the expertise where they live that can do the assessment, the diagnosis, and the intervention. And in our rural communities in nearly every state, that's a real challenge. One of the things that many LEND programs are doing now is trying to use telehealth as an opportunity to get that expertise to rural communities. Can you talk a little more about how telehealth is being used in the LEND program? Sure. It's, it's, it, I, I'll speak to our, our um, area. One of our big challenges in the metropolitan area, Minneapolis-St. Paul, we have a lot of programs, we have a lot of clinical services, we have a lot of, of trained professionals. In greater Minnesota, we don't. And so at our LEN program, we have our LEN faculty who are through the internet, through a secured way, and with training to the families, they're actually doing 
um, assessment, diagnostic, and intervention, uh, and then monitoring that intervention from screen to screen uh, in a family home. So the LEND program aspects of it can be implemented effectively through telemedicine? Absolutely. Okay, great. And we can't have a specialist for every discipline in every rural town in the U.S., so this is a really important part. Absolutely. I appreciate you making that point. At what age are children usually evaluated and diagnosed with autism? That really varies. It, it varies based on state. It varies based on community. Um, on average, it's it's just under five years of age when, when a child gets their first diagnosis. Um, but one, one thing we do know is that there were signs and there were comments from preschool teachers, from pediatrician that that identified perhaps characteristics of autism that go undiagnosed or get deferred until a child enters school. Is that diagnosis delayed at all in rural areas? It is, um, and that's really because there aren't, there aren't, a clinical diagnosis often is delayed because there aren't experts to um, provide that intervention. So what are the effects, if any, for children who are diagnosed with autism later in life versus earlier? Well, we know that the earlier that you're identified, the earlier that you get intervention, the better your communication skills are, and the, the better your educational outcomes are. And overall, in general, your life, your work, your um, capacity to earn a living, all of those things matter. So the path to a more productive life is benefited with an earlier diagnosis of autism. Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Kagan, um, is it more difficult to receive lifespan respite care in rural communities? <clears throat> As with any other program, especially when we're facing the direct uh, service workforce uh, shortage, uh, of course it is harder. Oklahoma, though, has had a wonderful program in place that they initiated with their initial uh, lifespan respite grant to do mobile respite where they partnered with the State Department of Transportation to get a van that was no longer used by the state, and they transfer workers and volunteers from the more urban areas out to the rural areas to provide uh, a day of respite for families in, in rural communities. Can you it's speak, a wonderful model. Can you speak briefly to the impact of the Lifespan Respite Care Reauthorization, Reauthorization Act on rural communities? Again, I think it's one of the few programs because it allows states to use funds to not only help families pay for respite, it, it allows them to build new services and test out these innovative models like uh, the volunteer, the volunteer uh, transportation. Okay. Uh, thank you for your indulgence, Madam Chair. I yield back. Most welcome. The gentleman yields back. Uh, now I'd like to uh, recognize um, uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, who's waving onto the subcommittee. He's the uh, chairman of the Communications and Technology Subcommittee of Energy and Commerce, and uh, uh, he and uh, uh, we all need to thank both uh, Mr. Doyle and Mr. Smith, who's also here, and we'll follow him uh, because they are the inside the Congress. These are the two top advocates relative to autism, not only with their legislation, but with the caucus that they have formed and. Uh, um, we, I, I want to salute both of them. So, um, Mr. Doyle, you have five minutes, and um, take it away, and we're all really very grateful to you for your leadership. Thank it's you, It's special, Madam and it matters. Thank you, and, uh, and I appreciate uh, you allowing us to wave on to the subcommittee uh, today to ask some questions, and, and I, I want to recognize my good friend Chris Smith. Uh, about 20 years ago, Chris and I were members of the Veterans Affairs Committee, and uh, we're sitting down having a conversation, uh, and that's when the idea come up. Uh, Chris was telling me about a spike in autism in Brick Township, New Jersey, uh, that they thought maybe there was an environmental cause to this, and I was relaying to him my experiences with a, uh, a family back in Pittsburgh, uh, the Tariski family, uh, Dan Tariski, who eventually became the national president of the Autism Society of America, um, and that's when we come up with the idea to start the caucus, because a lot of members of Congress didn't know what autism was, and, uh, uh, and not much was being done. And, and uh, Chris has been a real pleasure to work with uh, and a real champion uh, for the cause. I, I couldn't have a better co-chair 
uh, of the caucus than Chris Smith, and I, I want people to know that. Um, Dr. Ewart, we've heard a lot about early intervention. Um, can you share some of the information about the CDC's Learn the Signs Act and uh, Learn the Signs and Act Early, and and some of the other resources that are available, and and how can families use these resources to to help them uh, identify these signs? Sure. As I said in my introduction, we have one of the Learn the Signs Act Early programs in Minnesota. We've been fortunate to have that. We as a, as a program have decided to use those resources to develop educational materials and outreach to communities, in our, to, to various immigrant communities. So our Somali community, our Hmong community, our other East African communities as a, as a way to get parent-to-parent -parent information. So we've developed brochures, we've developed um, talking educational, like in-person educational programs to work to, to train families so that they can go into their communities and train other families about what to look for in their child's development and what concerns might arise and then what to, where to go if they, if they identify something. So, uh, Dr. Yo, we, we have a LEND program in Pittsburgh, uh, and, and it's been invaluable to us. I'm just curious, how do the LEND programs around the country interact with one another, and could LEND programs improve interaction to create more of a, natu uh, an, more of a national network? That's one of the great things about the LEND program. Through the Association of University Centers on Disability, we have a network, and we do work very closely together. Next month, we'll come together uh, at, for an Autism Cares National Conference where the LEND directors and LEND staff get together and we share what we're doing in our various states, learn from one another about effective programs, and then can take that back and replicate it. Tell me, what are some of your experiences and concerns as a family member that, are, uh, that you feel are not being addressed in your research uh, and research that's taking place around the country? Uh, again, I, I've said it before in this hearing, but issues related to transition, youth transitioning to adulthood and employment, so specialized employment programs that help support individuals who, with autism who are, are young adults and adults to find and uh, keep their employment. I think yeah, that's I can't a big tell you area. how many families uh, that I talk to uh, worry about you know, as their kids are aging out mm -hmm. of services. Uh, and as we know, uh, the, the first person I met with autism is now a 50-some-year-old adult. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a developmental disability that kills you. Uh, and families worry what, what happens to their children uh, when they're no longer around. And as we know, the spectrum depending on where you sit on that spectrum, uh, that can be a real concern. So uh, it's one of the things we're trying to address uh, in the legislation. Um, let me ask, uh, in your opinion, uh, what would be the benefits of CDC increasing a surveillance of adults uh, with ASD? I, I think it's really important, and I, as I said, there, we're working toward that by adding a, a small number of states that will be looking at 16-year-olds. We really just don't have prevalence data about adults um, with autism in the United States. And what the prevalence data does is help policymakers at that local and state level plan for services and supports. Um. Madam Chair, I see my time is expiring. I would like to seek unanimous consent to enter nine letters of support uh, from the following organizations into the record. Autism Speaks, two letters from them. The Autism Society of America, Association of University Centers on Disabilities, American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities, National Council on Severe Autism, Research America, and a letter of support from a diverse group of disability and health care organizations. Excuse me. Uh, so ordered. Uh, and uh, we just subtracted those, I think, successfully from my long list. But uh, uh, there's a real honor roll of organizations to thank the gentleman. Uh, I now uh, would like to ask uh, uh, for a unanimous consent um, of the uh, uh, ranking member of our subcommittee uh, because uh, 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 Congressman Smith is with us. But we have a rule at the committee that if you're not 
part of the full committee that you can't speak. But he's here, and I think he deserves, to, I, I really want to recognize him. So I ask uh, for unanimous consent uh, that Congressman Smith uh, uh, be able to um, uh, participate now and recognize him uh, for his five minutes of comments, questions, welcome, and thank you for your very fine work. We're all indebted to you for your leadership. Chairwoman uh, Eshoo, thank you for not only your strong personal, but your professional commitment to all of these important health issues, uh, including and especially the Autism Cares legislation, which is and continues to be historic. Uh, it, will, it is already making a difference, uh, but this new iteration, and Mike Doyle, you can't find a better friend uh, and champion for combating autism and helping across the board. Uh, you know, one of the features of our new bill uh, is to make it the lifespan, the emphasis is no way uh, diminished towards helping early childhood and, and children, uh, but we now know that about 50,000 people matriculate from uh, the minor to adulthood, uh, and there's a, so much that we don't know, so many needs that have to be met, including housing. Uh, our last Autism Cares Act, Mike and I, uh, uh, made it very clear that we wanted uh, a full assessment from GAO. We did that by letter uh, and in the bill from the administration. What is out there? What are the capabilities of local, federal, and state uh, governments to meet this growing and really almost exponentially growing need that is largely unmet? Uh, I want to thank Dr. Burgess, who's been a great friend in, uh, on so many issues. I chaired for years, now I'm ranking member, of the Africa Global Health Global Human Rights Committee and had hearings on Ebola, neglected tropical diseases, Zika, HIV, AIDS, malaria, TB, uh, autism, and uh, Alzheimer's, and Dr. Burgess was at so many of those hearings, I thought he was a member of the committee. So I want to thank him for his expertise as well because uh, and his concern. Um, this bill is, I think, going to make a difference. It was written with close collaboration of those organizations that was just cited. Autism Cares and Speaks uh, have been game changers. Um, it does provide one point, a little over $1.7 billion over five years. Uh, when, when I brought CDC to New Jersey uh, in 1997 because we had a prevalence spike, we thought, that was just brick township. Uh, CDC, to their, their shock and dismay, found when they did their data calls that other townships had similar prevalence increases uh, that could not be explained. You know what they were spending then for, um, for, um, uh, at CDC? $287,000 per year, straight line for five years. I even I asked them, what does that buy, a desk? Uh, you can't even do a review of literature that's credible with that kind of uh, puny spending. So uh, that has got up $23 million for CDC per year now, $50 million for HRSA, and Mike is planning on offering an amendment that tracks our appropriations number of $296 million per year uh, for uh, NIH. If you look at all of the data, this is the way an NIH program and a CDC coordinated program should run. Uh, they have a strategic plan. IAC does a wonderful job. They're not perfect, but a wonderful job. Uh, and they ask questions, and then they assign projects so there's no, less duplication and hopefully no duplication uh, of effort. We have 126 co-sponsors on this bill. Again, Mike and I have walked, worked across the aisle. They say that bipartisanship is dead. Not here and not with my good friend from Pennsylvania, uh, so I want to thank him for that. Uh, we also have included on IAC uh, what I think, what we think is so important, labor, justice, and HUD have now been included, so we get additional eyes and ears and buy-in from this, this whole-of-government approach. Uh, so it's, it's really a, a historic bill. It needs to pass, pass early. We never know what's going to happen in the Senate. But I, we have had conversations with Lamar Alexander, uh, and I do believe he's likely to hold it at the desk. Previous times, we had holds galore on it. Uh, you know, the Senate's arcane rules make it very hard to get important bills passed. Am I out of time? Almost. Um, and we, you know, we're working it proactively to try to mitigate the possibility of different members uh, putting a hold on it uh, so that it hopefully gets to the president and then sign. Mike and I, and this is one of the untold stories, the reason why NIH and CDC is up uh, the way it is, 
We lobby the daylights out of our friends, and they are our friends, whether it be Tom Cole uh, or others when he was chairman of the Liberia HHS bill, to keep putting that number up because the need is overwhelming. Uh, we don't have our arms around this yet. As has been said, uh, and Dr. Hewitt, thank you for your testimony and leadership, uh, we're still expanding, and uh, it is global. I have a bill that I've been unsuccessful in getting passed uh, that would be a global autism bill. Uh, because it's everywhere. It's all over Africa. It's all over Latin America. It's everywhere. Uh, and we have only made a small dent in that. But the United States is leading this bipartisanship. Uh, Mike, thank you. You've been a great friend and a great champion. I yield back and thank you, uh, Chairwoman Eshoo, for this time. The gentleman yields back. And uh, we're so pleased that uh, both of you uh, were here today. It, it means everything to uh, uh, whomever is listening in, certainly to all of the advocates and uh, all the members of the subcommittee. Uh, well, I think that um, we don't have any uh, members here for any additional questions, so uh, I want to thank uh, uh, this panel of witnesses. Uh, I think you've been outstanding. Uh, you've answered the questions directly. We have learned from you. You've deepened and broadened our knowledge on uh, the issues. Uh, these are four bills that deserve to uh, move on to uh, uh, being uh, 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 reauthorized, uh, they're important for the American people. Uh, and, uh, you know, these are words that are written on paper, but I always say, you know, you put legs, you put feet on those words, they walk right into people's lives. So uh, thank you for, uh, uh, for testifying today. We're, uh, on behalf of all of uh, the members of the sub subcommittee, we're very grateful to you. And uh, remind members, of course, there are only a couple of us left in the room now, uh, that pursuant to committee rules, each member has uh, 10 days to submit additional questions for the record uh, to be answered by the witnesses uh, who have appeared. So I ask each witness that uh, you respond promptly to any of the questions uh, that you may receive member, uh, from members. And I now would like to ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record the following. It's a, it's a long list. Um, these are the documents that uh, I'd like to place in the record. The Coalition Letter in Support of H.R. 2507, Statement from the March of Dimes in Support of H.R. 2507, Statement from the Aiden Jack Sager in Support of 2507, the letter from AARP in support of 2035, letter from the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities in support of 2035, letter from the American Speech Language Hearing Association in support of 1058, letter from the Association of University Centers on Disabilities in support of 1058, coalition letter in support of HR 1058, uh, a letter from Research America in support of 1058, coalition letter in support of uh, 776, and a statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics in support of 776. Hearing no objections, so ordered. And with that, the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>